Welcome to stage 18 of the Tour of Italy, going 115 kilometers from uh, Selva uh, Val da Gardena to the Alpe di Pompeago. Just 115 kilometers today, a, a sniff of 72 miles. You might see, well, it's nothing I could do on my bike. Uh, when I go shopping, perhaps I could take a detour around Sainsbury's and get that far. But we've got uh, two thumping great climbs uh, on the way through to the finish, and the finish is up at 1,760 meters above sea level. We've got 44 kilometers to go in the race now on the climb of Slan Floriano uh, when they get to the top it'd be 1,512 meters above sea level and you can see now Chepe Gonzalez wearing the green jersey of the king of the mountains is now beginning to put the pressure on the field he's gone away for a break before we came on air uh, we had a breakaway group uh, uh, earlier on I'll just give you a quick rundown on who they were before we pick up the action here with this uh, specialist uh, Colombian climber who although he wears a green jersey He's not the actual leader on the King of the Mountains. That is Marco Pantani, who has the pink jersey as the race leader overall. And you can't wear two jerseys unless you want to get slightly cooked on your way towards the finish. So you can see where we are now on this climb up here. So Pantani hands down the King of the Mountains jersey the man who's second overall in the classification and that's the fellow we just seen on our screen uh, climbing up the top of this first of the of the climb and you see how it goes right towards the end and this is the day when Pantani has to really open up the gap on uh, uh, Alex Zuller and also on that other great man who's pitched there looking for the opportunity of taking the pink jersey, Pavel Tonkov, who's won this race, uh, not this year, but he's There we are, there's Pantani on his screen, and now we quickly go through. On the left-hand side, that's Alex Zuller, who lost the jersey yesterday. I'm sure back in Great Britain, you might have caught up with the results in your newspapers. Perhaps not all the reasons how it happened, and I hope you heard our broadcast yesterday, but if you didn't, I'll put you in the picture about what happened when that man, Pantani, ripped the whole thing to pieces. And Pantani has destroyed a lot of people's aims and ambitions, and they were just dropping like stones yesterday. And the biggest story is, before we come back to Chepe Gala, this man here on your screen, Marco Pantani, yesterday, by his supreme performance, he actually eliminated 34 riders. Yes. Yesterday, outside the time, there were 34 riders and the actual time cutoff point was 34 minutes and that's exactly what Pantani did uh, he also averaged 34 kilometers per hour so the big number yesterday was 34 suddenly there one of the Festina riders blows and Pantani now uh, is beginning to get rid of the uh, Festina boys but not yet Alex Zulla who's still just up there in front of him. let's see how he goes now there is uh, Tonkov looking for a gap to come through and that's what happens. These are the domestics. These are the people who keep the pace up, and suddenly the legs get snapped, and out they go. And a lot of riders went out yesterday. Apart from the 34, outside the time limit, we had some massive retirements too. People who just climbed off their bikes, and uh, amongst those who retired was Cipollini, Magnussen, Piedominko, and Kelly. They all said, we've had enough. Uh, Anderson and Larson also joined him in the, what they call the sag wagon. And much was to do with the climbing of uh, Pantani, and this special you're seeing, well, to get the camera's background again, you're seeing on your screen now, Chepe Gonzalez himself, and you can look at it, you know, like a little whippet, isn't he, on two wheels. He's built for climbing, he's a specialist at this particular sport, and yesterday, today and tomorrow, the mountain climbers are about to destroy the other people who can't stay on their wheels. And amongst those who were chopped out yesterday, uh, perhaps the biggest uh, surprise and disappointment to many people uh, was the fact that the uh, uh, the Bartoli, who had been leading in the Chiclamino jersey competition, he was shelled out, spat out yesterday, and finished outside the time limit. So he's gone. Uh, bit news, and watch this lot go up here, by the way, that Bartoli actually stopped twice yesterday and then rode on to finish outside the time limit. He desperately wanted to finish, but it was just too much for him. The speed of the specialist climbers just saw him off. And you're watching it now on the screen. It's action from the Tour of Italy. We've never done on Eurosport the Tour of Italy back-to-back -back every 22 stages right the way through, and you're watching. To me, I, I've always loved the Tour of Italy because it, it seems to finish uh, in the mountains with a great drama. 
Um, it builds up uh, like an, an orchestra starting to, to tune up, and then we have the overture down as we go along, uh, the, as we did this time, down the shin of Italy, pick up a few climbs here and there, they come back up the calf and up toward the top end of the leg now, and we get all the action in the Dolomites and across the Alps, and we're not yet finished yet. The fat lady hasn't started to sing in Milan. That's on Sunday. And right now, the specialist climbers are really sort this one out. And you can go back over the years in the Tour of Italy to when we last had a specialist climber win the race. Ivan Gotti, who last year was successful, he, he's quite a good climber, but I wouldn't talk, say he's a specialist climber. Uh, Pavel Tonkov, 1996, in the race today. Uh, not a specialist climber. Uh, Tony Romiger, Berzin, a lot of people who could actually stand the pressure of the mountains and also time trial. They've been winning for some years, but we can go further back and pick up one or two of the of the top climbers of their day who succeeded in winning this one uh, by their ability to climb up the big mountain, like uh, Charlie Gore in 1956, Charlie Gore in 1959. He was only a specialist mountain climber. Yes, he could time trial a bit. Yes, he could ride with the, the race, but we're seeing now what well, I'm very pleased to see. This man Pantani must have gone along and patted the organized on the back when he saw the course this year it was tailor-made for a man who's got the wings of an angel that can fly so you're looking down your screen at the pink pirate i've always wanted to say that i've heard of pink panthers we got the pink panther now because he's known as a pirate he wears a little earring and he shaves his head and on the saddle there if they could put the camera on the top of that saddle you'll see he's got stitched into the leather top of it uh, a, a, an illustration of a pirate and the il palito they've also called him some other things like el fantino because of his his large Years. Um, something's also about his bald head, but one thing they can't uh, uh, get away from is the fact this bloke can climb. He's a specialist climber. He's built to climb. He's uh, not very heavy at all. As he's coming up now, he's at, what, 57 uh, kilograms uh, when he's at the racing weight. He's only 1 meter 72 tall, and that's the fellow on your screen now. Did a little fellow built for this particular job. On the left-hand side of him, Pavel Tonkov. Uh, there you can see him in the map A colors. Uh, who won this race two years ago and was second last year. He's not built as a climber, he's a bit more chunky, but he's got courage, he's tenacity to fight hard. And the other uh, fellow who's surviving at the moment on guts and determination, the top left-hand corner of your screen, Alex Zuller, who had that, yellow, that uh, pink jersey until yesterday. But back again with another specialist climber. So uh, we've been, if you've been watching this Tour of Italy unfold in the recent uh, couple of weeks, you will have seen all sorts of people acting out on the stage, the sprinter specialists, uh, who now are virtually gone, by the way, because yesterday, uh, Ada was blasted out the back and finished uh, outside the time limit. He's very good sp sprinter for the Kelmy uh, Costa Blanca team. And we also know that climbing off his bike uh, yesterday, Cipollini, another man outside the time limit yesterday, Martin Alou, who's had a couple of second places in the sprint finishes. And Martin Alou took the pink jersey briefly when the Tour of Italy started in Athens, of all places. That was to commemorate the Olympic Games in 1996. But he's also been on his bike and he's gone back and that's it so we lost 34 riders outside the time and it plus the non-starters uh, sorry non-finishers as well so we really have thinned the whole thing down we're down to 98 riders that's all 98 riders left in the race and we've still got a thumping day racing ahead of us here uh, with the uh, Chepi Gonzalez ripping the legs off everybody else and we've still got another stage tomorrow which will finish up the top of big climb and more damage can be done but going back to yesterday and the situation as it is now with one kilometre to go. Marco Pantani in the pink jersey is just 30 seconds ahead of Pavel Tonkov, who we've seen. Uh, don't worry too much about this fellow, by the way. He's well down on general classification. He's just after getting some more points in the King of the Mountains competition. So at the moment there, Pantani's first on general classification. The man in front of him there, uh, Maffei Rad, disappearing off your screen, uh, is now uh, lying second, Tonkov. Garini, who we can't yet see at the moment, riding for the Pulte team, is third. And uh, there, we just a quick look at Michelli. He's sixth overall, seven minutes and 18 seconds. There he is, fellow in the Risso Scotty colours on his screen now. Garini won't be far away for the Pulte team. Uh, and uh, Zulla's now, if we move the camera a bit to the left, we've seen enough of Pantani. There we go. There he is, up on the front of this lot, towing it along. Alex Zuller uh, is in fourth spot at one minute and one second. Now, the significance of this, and I'm interested to see how uh, Zuller's setting the pace in front, because he had a very, 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 very bad day uh, yesterday. 
I know he's not supposed to say very, very twice, but I said it four times deliberately because he had an awful day yesterday. When he finished, he, he sort of fell off his bike and he said, un mal dia in Spanish, a very bad day indeed. And uh, he speaks fluent Spanish, having written for the Anse team for many years, and he went through a bad day yesterday, but he looks much better today. If you look at his face, and if you saw yesterday's programme, you'll see a complete difference. Um, if you're racing for 22 days, you can't expect to go day in, day out without feeling a bit grossy one day or the other. And these four seem to have uh, managed to drop the rest out of, the, out of uh, contention. But this is the first of climbs of today. Uh, I've said, well, there's back to Greeny and Kamazin. I thought they wouldn't be far away. But uh, uh, what Zula has to do, he's got to stay close. Stick to him now, like Batman and Boy Robin, to Pantani. Because when we come to time trial on Saturday, uh, Alex Zula, superb time trial, is in Trieste on the last uh, uh, time trial we had, uh, what was that, three days ago now, he knocked out uh, nearly three and a half minutes out of, uh, uh, out of Pantani, because he's that superb time trialer. So what Pantani's got to do today and tomorrow is to make sure, uh, forget Mr. Uh, Chevy Gonzalez at the moment, is to make sure that he, today and tomorrow, Pantani, can punch between four and five minutes out of Zula. If he doesn't go out of the mountains uh, the day after to tomorrow uh, with about five minutes leave, four minutes may do, but five minutes, uh, then he might still lose the uh, Giro d'Italia on the Saturday in the time trial. So we, we're going to see on Eurosport now the real culmination of the Tour of Italy building itself up day in, day out. And there goes Chevy Gonzalez now getting himself points in the Kingdom Manage competition. Uh, so he started second this morning, had 33 points to Pantani's 55. Uh, that will bring him on a bit, but Pantani's not far behind, and Pantani may romp past uh, Zola. No, he's not going to. That's interesting. He's not too bothered about the green jersey. He's back in four spot there at the moment. So uh, Pantani dropping a bit down the GC on uh, the points for the Kingdom Man, but uh, he won't lose that jersey unless this fellow manages to get the next climbs yet to come, because we've got some stinking climbs still ahead of us, and uh, the remnants of the race, the 98 riders from the 162 that set off to begin with, getting it down to only half the field as it is, uh, will now be struggling their way up this climb, try to regroup as we go down the other side, and then we start to go up the Passa de la Valetzi, and then on through the Intergiallo at Cavalese to the finish, which is 1,760 metres above fit sea level, and that's what Pantani wants, an uphill finish. So, really, the uh, weekly magazine back in England, uh, Cycling, said in their, looking at the uh, tour this year, they said, the sting in the Giro's tail, and we're right there with the sting of the tail. Now, the Scorpions are about to strike. Stay with us for more action coming up. 1987, he was king of the mountains, and that was the year when he went on to be second behind Stephen Roche. I'm hoping, by the way, says he keeping his fingers crossed, and don't hold me to this, but uh, it might well be, because Stephen Roche comes out uh, to the Tour of Italy towards the back end. He's not been working on it uh, officially this year. Normally he's worked for one of the Italian television stations, but of course the Pro Tour was taking up a lot of his time, but we might be able to hook him tomorrow, uh, and if we do, we're on air all going well, provided it doesn't... Uh, uh, circumstances don't change and the tennis is rained off or something in Paris but if, uh, I think conditions might be okay there but uh, if uh, we are on air tomorrow well, we're certainly going to be on air tomorrow at half past 10 Central European time we could be on air for about three hours in the morning and I'm hoping that I should be able to get my fishing net out and hook the bowl Stephen Rose so uh, if you want to uh, set your video recorders or if you're at home and you want to switch on around about half past nine uh, British time we may have the, the bowl Irishman on board but you never know he's a very elusive chap and difficult to catch hold of from time to time still we should survive the three hours and so will the riders on what is going to be this, uh, the last of the big days in the mountain and Pantani has to do something today and tomorrow that's the fellow in the pink and they've now got uh, Chevy Gonzalez pulled back so he's uh, been absorbed by the main pack and I think his moment of glory is over as we now start in the final climb of the day. Coming then through, we've come through uh, Cavalese, and it's quite an interesting part of the world. I'm sorry, as we come through there, we haven't had much time to dwell on it, as the Festina team are working hard at the front. This part of the world round here, the, we, we've come very close to a place called Trento, and round here in the Val de Fiemme was almost an independent state. Uh, in the old days, lots of areas, with now some eight kilometres to go from the finish, had their own uh, little independent states, their own parliaments as well, and uh, uh, there is a... In Cavalese, they've got all this sort of stone benches they used to sit on uh, for the parliament to, to, to stand, or to sit, as the case may be, in judgment. 
I suppose at least in this part of the world, Zula can, can, can converse with people because the, a lot of them, it's half German in this area, it's the Alto AJ Sud-Tirol, we've just been coming through it, so got quite a, a, a a fair number of German people around about and Finnish schnitzel and sauerkraut and goulash and things like that are very much on the on the menu so perhaps that although he had a bad day yesterday uh, Zola, he feels at home now as Cameron starts on this climb to put the pressure on and being very quickly answered by the rather from the Azic CGA team uh, Paolo Bettini who had the green jersey as the king of the mountains for a short period in time Bettini also uh, rocketed up the overall classic cage he, he to me is from the revelations of the race this man here Bettini you see on your screen with the uh, Kamazin. Kamazin won't uh, attack him by the way I think he just sit there because uh, uh, Tonkov is the best hope of the Mape Brickaby team for an overall uh, pos good position in the race and one by one they're drifting off the back there another Mape riders beginning to find it a bit difficult number 95 on his screen there that's uh, uh, Kodo Masiximo Kodo who also leapt up the general classification yesterday he jumped from uh, 58th to 36th uh, on the classification so Kodol now up in 36 spot, but he's still trying to go even better today. Fellows in here in the green, white and blue colours, the national colours, a champion of, of Italy, also riding for the Mappe Brickaby team, so they're, they're well represented at the moment. And Pantani might have to start going some. Uh, in this morning was t fifth overall at 4 minutes and 13 seconds. I don't think he can get that back on this particular climb here, but he can frighten Pantani a bit, because if uh, Pantani allows people like Camazin to start to move up, then the, the Mappe uh, Brickaby team can start to play several different cards. Uh, Bettini at 11 minutes and one second, that's number 22 on the left-hand side at the moment. Well, he's way down and there's no great threat as far as he's concerned. He has, of course, had his moments of glory because uh, he surprised himself and everybody else uh, by, I think, by his performance in the race so far. And uh, let's see what he can do on this stage now. He tried to get uh, a victory, but uh, he hasn't quite made it now. He's taken over the, the green jersey right the way through from the stage into Matera and now let's see what he can do on the stage today we had a, a short period by the way when the looked like the Azic CGA squad were going to sort of dominate the whole thing they've got uh, riders I mean, Bettini tried to win the stage went to uh, uh, Asiago when Fontanelli got that one he finished in second spot then and he was one of the riders in the world championships uh, what three years ago when uh, they, they got all the, all the four top places, the Italians. He was one of those chaps there. So Bettini's uh, really now started to come good in the race, and uh, he's now romping away down the road, because that's actually a bit thin on the ground since the problems yesterday when uh, uh, the top man, Bartoli, who had the Ciclamino points jersey, uh, retired from the road. Well, was outside the time and it eliminated so I think they're looking now to let Bettini fly loose and that will suit uh, Alex Zuller in the centre of there with a long tall gangling fellow looking good at the moment still got his teammate with him uh, Belly Vladimir Belly of the uh, Festina team was hired this year for the team to protect uh, Zola on the climb. He did a wonderful job yesterday, but in the end, uh, Zola ran out of steam. And Chevy Gonzalez is coming back again uh, to start to attack and to try and come back up these two here. He's really determined to get some more points for his King of the Mountains competition. But Camazin, uh, together with Bettini, out the front at the moment, and Pantani has to start to go. He's leaving this very late indeed, and he's being under pressure too. I can see just moving up there, we've got the uh, support from his Mercosur Uno team here, but he can't stand it because they're all hovering round about him. Still then, the top men are linked, locked together. <laughs> Getting towards the top of the final climb of the day of this stage, taking the uh, riders through from uh, uh, Selva Val Gardena to Alpe de Pambiago. Uh, 115 kilometres in all, that's uh, 72 miles of racing on this stage, 18 of the Tour of Italy. They'll be racing for 18 days plus the prologue time trial too and still it's very much in the balance here as we see the good work being done by the Mercatone Uno rider, Garzelli, working hard trying to keep some, give some shelter uh, to Pantani who seems to be a little bit off the boil today. He hasn't been so quite so chirpy as we've seen in the past. Up in front we've still got this uh, breakaway, these twosome of Oscar Camazin and uh, Paolo Bettini. 
Neither of them any threats overall to the pink jersey of uh, Marco Pantani. And the rest of the main boys on the, the, the list of the top ten are still round about them. Let me give you a quick rundown on the general classification as we move in then to the final part of this uh, stage as Bettini on the right-hand side drifts back. He was the man who enlivened the stage 16 uh, in the race when he went away. Uh, he was nowhere. He was round about front. 15 minutes down on the start of the day. He went with a group of riders that went away. He finished in the uh, um, second spot behind Fontenelle, who, by the way, was eliminated yesterday. So Bettini's now been blown off. He did get to third over on general classification, but uh, he's now being distanced. And now Pantani's start to attack, and he's towing with him uh, uh, Tonkov. Hazula drifts out the back. So quickly then a run down on the general classification. We've got the top three men on your screen. Marco Pantani leading overall in the uh, Tour of Italy. An average speed so far. 39.584 kilometers per hour, just a sniff under 25 miles an hour for 18 days of racing, and uh, Pantani on the front. He is at 30 seconds ahead of Tonkov, there, number 91 for the Mape Brickaby team. He is one minute and one second ahead of Alex Zula, who's in fourth spot. As you see now, Pantani deciding it's about time he got stuck in and tried to rip these people to pieces. The only man at the moment, not with that uh, threesome going away, is just off the back there, and that is uh, Giuseppe Gorini of the Pulte team at 31 seconds on general classification. So, but uh, Paolo Bettini's fought his way back uh, to Camazin. No, Camazin's going again. And Bettini will have to try and fight his way back again. Camera's in this morning, 4 minutes, 13 seconds down on uh, Pantani. You can see now there's nothing much in it, but as uh, Chepi Gonzalez leads the chase up it. Gonzalez is interested, A, if he can win the stage, B, in getting more points than Kingdom Man, being followed by the uh, pink uh, pirate himself. Then uh, Zola there, together with his belly, Michelli, and that is Garini. So we've got, at the moment, the uh, top... Uh, Six riders on general classification on your screens, and the odd ball out is the little fellow from uh, Colombia, and also number 75 drifting off your screen now. He's done his job, that's, just, that's what he's got to do. In fact, it was Fabian Jaeger that stopped with, uh, uh, with Zula, not his other teammate Vladimir Belli. But now the top men are all having a go at each other, except, of course, this little fellow at the moment uh, up in front. He's not nowhere on general classification, likely to threaten the little lot because. Uh, He's lost too much time in the time trial, but he's looked for a stage victory, but he could cause almost a lot of damage here. Camerson very perkily has gone off the front, but he's going to be pulled back surely by the pressure that you see being put on by Chevy Gonzalez. Gonzalez is 30th overall at 23 minutes and 33 seconds on general classification, so he's no threat to, to uh, Pantani with five kilometres to go. This is exactly what Alex Zuller must have hoped for today. He was bad, bad, bad yesterday, and now he's come good, good, good today. He's followed uh, the moves, he's been on the front of Pantani, showing him he's not dead yet, and Pantani has got to get, as I said uh, earlier on today, that Pantani has to get something in the thick end between four minutes or more between himself and Zuller, and he's not going to do it in five kilometres today. Uh, Chepi Gonzalez here, looking good, looking for a stage victory. So. It is still very good, delicately balanced, and Zula must be thankful that Pantani here on your screen, in the pink, has been able to develop the killer blow on the stage today. Uh, tomorrow, uh, let me have a quick uh, rundown on, on the stage tomorrow, because we finish again up the top of a climb, and let's see if it's any worse than we're going to have today for you, because I'm sure you like to know what's going on. We've got uh, um, three King of the Managed Climbs, and we're looking at the man in the green jersey lying second in the competition, Chepa Gonzalez. We finish up at the uh, uh, Plan de Monte Campione tomorrow, and that again is a climb about the same, 1,750 metres above sea level, and it's all in the final 20 kilometres, so Pantani here has got to start going some. I love these, these specialist climbs, look at it bouncing around here. But he hasn't done the damage today, Pantani. He must have been suffering from what he did yesterday. Do you imagine that, to uh, eliminate 34 riders? Apart from that, the numbers that climbed off yesterday because they were absolutely smashed out. Uh, and the others lot that he got rid of, 34 of them, outside the 34 
uh, minutes time limit and then the background the snow is still up there these are the mountains these are the dolomites these are the behind and further over to the uh, uh, left are the alps where we're going to be still hang on there they're the Kami team encouraging their man to go and get stuck in it's all right sitting in a nice car because these boys out have been pedaling their bikes today fortunately a short sharp stage i often think that the short stages can uh, can wreak havoc on the race because a lot of blokes are now way down the road including people like uh, uh, Gianni Bugno and Claudio Chiapucci, who I know some of you like to know where the old soldiers are. Gianni Bugno this morning started in 60th place, 56 minutes down on Pantani. Claudio Chiapucci was 62nd, 59 minutes and 27 seconds down. And I think, as he tapping the side of his nose, that tomorrow, after we had that uh, big mountain climb, we go... Sorry, after tomorrow, the next day, whatever day of the week it is, will that be Friday? It could be Friday. Um, on the stage 20, when we, when we roll out, we're actually going to a place called Mendriso, which is north of Milan, and that day, there's only one short little climb in the uh, first 34 kilometres. After that, it's fairly undulating, up and down, up and down, up and down, and you watch if you're going to... I hope you'll join me on that uh, on, on, on Friday, on stage 20. Uh, yes, it is... Uh, uh, Venedi, the, the, the 5th of July, that we're going to have a, an up and down run in towards the finish there. And you watch, says he, Mr. Bugno and Mr. Kipucci trying to get themselves a good position on the day because the rest of the riders will be uh, saving their strength for the time trial the next day. We're watching the action then, the battle, not only to see who wins the stage today, but as to whether uh, Mr. Pantani can pull a few more seconds out of the two blokes hovering right behind him now and they're prepared, Zilla certainly is prepared to follow him all the way up now as uh, Bettini pulls over he's blown a gasket, that's it Pantani starts to ride away to try and get his uh, second uh, successive well, well, second successive day in the pink jersey will be for sure, he hasn't got the stage victory yet by any means, he took the one into Pian Cabello, uh, did Pantani, he didn't get it yesterday because Guarini pipped him on the line, he wasn't too worried about that because he took over the pink jersey the pink pirate himself now, starting to go in, Zula's being distanced, Zula's being distanced and so Zula must, must, must stay close, but mind you I suggest possibly Zula will be happy Happy if he can still finish within a minute of Pantani because at the moment he started out this morning uh, just at uh, one minute and one second behind Pantani. The time trial in uh, not tomorrow nor the next day but Saturday if he if he is still within two minutes of Pantani he can still get the pink jersey in Milan and uh, win this race overall. That's what he's been hired to do, Zola. And there, Garini starts to sit on the wheel of Michelli and the, the field is opening up just a little bit now and Zola is back and being dropped. Pantani going away now with Tonkov. Tonkov will sit on his wheel. This morning then, as we started out, Pavel Tonkov, 30 seconds behind Pantani. There are bonuses at the top, 12 seconds for first, eight seconds for second spot, and four seconds for third. So we better start writing down the results because these few seconds are going to make uh, uh, quite a bit of difference to the overall situation as Michelli then starts to ride up uh, with the best people. He's, he's been moving up for the overall classification bit by bit, Michelli, but he's not a great threat to either of these two as Tonkov starts to pile away on the front. A quick look to see the state of Pantani. Pantani is very good at accelerating. He's an erratic rider when it comes to, to climbing the mountain. He goes fast, slows down, goes fast, slows down. Tonkov hovering behind him. Well, this really is the moment when Pantani ought to be going a lot faster. You can see how, how they're climbing here. It may not look that uh, quick, but it's tough. Pantani still stretching the legs. First upon the scene did Pantani in 1994 when he went two stages of the Giro de Sally, where he said, who? And he took them back to back in the mountains that we're, we're looking at now and surprised everybody by his performance that year. That was a tremendous performance. And they all looked around and said, ah, but yes, he did well in the baby Giro, as they call it. Finished third in the Tour de France in 1994, did Pantani. And but that terrible crash that he had, when he smashed his legs, we might have seen more of that phenomenal climber. But here, Alex Zola, knowing what he's got to do, just stay cool, stay with it. And there his team car starts to come up to him. The time check's so important now for uh, Zola. He can't afford to lose more than a minute today, because he might lose another minute tomorrow. And that will take him over three minutes back. And in the time trial we had at Triesti, Pantani was caught by Zola by three minutes and then dropped.
This is the balance between the all-rounders of Azula. See those bands on his sleeves, those rainbow bands? That shows that he was the world time trial champion. And now Pantani trying to take even more time out of him. The specialist climbers are bemoaning the fact that the big uh, tours now are no longer being slanted towards them. In the days when uh, people like Van Impe used to win the Tour de France, for instance, a specialist climber, Charlie Gaul used to win the Tour de France, and for instance, Charlie Gaul winning the, the Tour of Italy. These people who had that ability to, like angels, to climb up the, uh, fly up into the sky and win the big stage in the mountains. They seem to be disappearing a bit now. The control that's coming in, the team tactics and so on, and the importance of the time trials. And Veronke was, it said, before the Tour de France, uh, also when, when the, the Tour de France was announced, and before he'd even sat on his bike and started it, when I was at the presentation last October, that it was not for him, the Tour de France this year. It wasn't mountainous enough, and it was for the all-rounders and, and the specialist time trialists. Well, I thought that was being a little bit uh, uh, negative, really, and uh, what a great thing would be if this man, Zula, on your screen now can uh, get the Tour of Italy and the Tour de France. Now, I couldn't... The bookie wouldn't take my odds on that one, and perhaps he might have wished he had, because with Pantani here going rather well, there's still a sort of feeling that Pantani might get the pink jersey all the way to Milan, but he's got to go that much further. He seems to have lost the zip that he had yesterday. But I'm not surprised. The climbs they went over yesterday were absolutely astronomical, and with four consecutive thumping great climbs yesterday, these riders have got absolutely be uh, yes yes another word you know the word i not sit on there i want to keep my job but the state they're in look at them now look at Zola. he went through hell yesterday one of the worst days in his cycle racing career and he's back here today on his bike and pantani who's trying to find a bit of strength in his legs he came into this race a little bit under race he had uh, a little bit of illness which stopped him riding for about uh, a week or so. He couldn't do the sort of training he wanted to do. And he's just a little bit off the form. There's the devil himself. Uh, no, it's not Claudio Chiapucci. This is the chap who always turns up towards the back end of the race to see himself on television. <laughs> it takes all sorts, doesn't it, to make the world. But if you're all normal and went to work with a bowler hat and a striped suit and carrying our sandwiches in a tattoo case, what a dull word it would be. But people like him, I think, are absolute characters. They spend time, as we now two kilometres to go, planning their next uh, exhibition. And here they are, out to the side of the road, the enthusiasts, the cycling uh, people who love the sport, the holiday makers who come out to see him, the, the talented voters. Look at the state they're in now. They're absolutely going bananas. Now, they've got reason here to cheer, not only because Pantani is an Italian riding for Mercatone Uno, and Bianchi, by the way, because yesterday they went over the big climb uh, which celebrated uh, the great Fausto Coppi. He used to ride for Bianchi de Fausto Coppi. Yes, I know I've mentioned the name again, but the Italians love to see an Italian on an Italian bike uh, winning their Tour of Italy. But behind that man, Pavel Tonkov, although he's a Russian, he rides for an Italian team, the MAPE team. He rides on an Italian bike uh, as well, Mr. Calnago, who's a very great specialist in beautiful bicycles. And you can see the enthusiasm of these people here are urging on these two riders. They're just wrapped up in it totally. They're They've read about it in the Gazette de la Sport. They bought themselves a, a pink hat. Uh, they've sat on the side of the road. They've listened to the uh, radios on the way up. They've got their portal television sets, and they're here urging them on all the way up. You can feel the enthusiasm. It's oozing through. And when you come driving up to these mountains, when you come to these spectators, they have to walk all the way up or drive their cars at the crack of dawn because the roads get closed down. And they're there wanting to see this free show on the side of the road, and they nearly get run over for the troubles as well as Mr. Ducati nearly hammered them into the ground on his bike. There's another famous Italian name, isn't it, Ducati? I've noticed they slapped his name of the motorbike on top of his um, on top of his, his pannier bag at the back there. Tonkov's looking extremely strong now. Alex Zula, who is a Swiss rider, uh, riding for a, a, a Spanish watch manufacturer on a French bicycle made by Mr. Peugeot here. Uh, this is an amazing combination of nationalities we've got here, but certainly they'll be applauding the valiant effort he's having to put in here to stay within maybe a minute or a minute and a half of Pantani. And Tonkov looks the stronger at the moment. Tonkov to me for the MAPE team. He is uh, sponsored by a company that uh, are involved in uh, chemicals and glues and uh, he is now pulling away from Mercatone, which is a supermarket group in uh, Italy. I'll try and put these things in because you say, well, who the hell are they? Why are they paid to ride their bikes like this? Well, the answer is that many of these sponsors out in uh, France and Spain and 
Italy see the value of their name being exposed on television and the following they get is masses of people out here who read everything about the sport and they're not just cyclists who look watching out here they're just spectators the tifosi who may also be on the side of the road comes the time of the uh, uh, of the of the rallies and they go down to the Imola and Modena and they go and look at the, the motor cars and they watch the sport at motorcycling as well they tremendously enthusiastic and of course when it comes to football way the challenge are over the top as well and what a great uh, lot of football we're going to have on Eurosport for you all the 65 64 matches will be on Eurosport nearly 12 hours of football during the World Cup and so we're bringing a great celebration of all sorts of sport on Eurosport but now the first time the Giro d'Italia on the screens an Italian is in pink and uh, we haven't had an Italian uh, well the Italian got he won it last year before that the Italians hadn't had a victory since Gianni Borgo in 1990 do they want a back-to-back -back victory Gotti from sickness suffering uh, from gastroenterology writers has dropped out the race so all hopes now for the Italians to get the second successive year of victory rests on the broad shoulders and the bald head of Marco Pantani well, I must get my clock out and do some quick time checks on this one because uh, I've been really sucked into the, the action which has been going on out there, but I don't think that Pantana is going to knock enough out of, uh, um, of Zula really to uh, cause Zula any major problems. He's left it a bit late on this climb, Pantani. He must be very tired from yesterday's efforts. And the big thing is having broken both his legs in that terrible crash in October, it was just over two years ago now, to be here, you can watch him on your screen, fighting him when most people felt he would hardly ever walk again, let alone ride a bike. So he has had a, a, a quiet time today after the, uh, the, the leg sapping race he did yesterday. One can understand why uh, he's struggling right now at the moment. But uh, really the crowd are absolutely uh, tickled pink to see him in the pink. And the way he's going now, there's no doubt about it that the man he's... he's He's, he's tracking Tonkov 30 seconds down in the last kilometre. Shouldn't take that time out of him. And so he can keep the pink jersey yet again and all being well, keep it again tomorrow. But uh, uh, Zula looks much better today, much, much better uh, to me. Sitting there, uh, just controlling his effort as Pantani tracking Tonkov. Uh, there's 12 seconds bonus and then 8 seconds, so Tonkov isn't going in this final kilometre to be able to pull back those 30 seconds on Pantani. But if he wins the stage, he will narrow the gap by some uh, 4 seconds, but I don't think that uh, Pantani is too worried about that one. It's a nasty, nasty finish, this one. 45 seconds on your clock now, back to uh, Zula. So he is probably going to get, plus the bonuses, the thick end of a minute on, uh, on Zula, but it's not going to be enough then. And Zula really hanging on in here at the moment, riding well with Garini. Tonkov ploughing away. Tonkov also prepared to distance himself from uh, Zula. The interesting thing is, this morning there's only 31 seconds between uh, Tonkov and, uh, and Zula, and Tonkov is not a bad time trialist. He, uh, he could well surprise people when it comes to the, the time trial, and Zula will have to watch out for that one, because in the, uh, the time trial at uh, Trieste, although uh, Zula romped around that one, it, it tremendously uh, fast and absolutely brilliant performance you never know with Tonka what he can pull out when it comes to time trialing and could well surprise uh, uh, Zula so Zula's got to be, I think, be more worried perhaps about uh, Tonkov than he has to be about um, uh, the performance of uh, Pantani who's a specialist mountain climber only one more day to go so Tonkov may be hovering there and about to cause a few problems we shall have to wait and see a way to earn a living <laughs> you have to enjoy cycling do it but apart from that when this fellow uh, Pantani had to fight his way back after uh, that terrible accident you can imagine that he to dedicate himself to the uh, the training he had to do you have to enjoy going out and riding your bike and just, just working to build yourself back up you know, I found what I was looking for um, in the time trial at uh, Trieste Tonkov was 1 minute 22 seconds behind uh, uh, Zula. So my uh, interest now, your interest I hope, is where's the difference between Tonkov here at the finish and Zula? Because though Pantani is going away from Zula and is adding to the difference between himself and Alex Zula, also Tonkov is doing the same thing. And Tonkov there this morning was 31 seconds ahead of Alex Zula. 
and in the time trial at Trieste uh, on stage 15, Tonkov was 1 minute and 22 seconds down on Zula. So he's about, the last time check we had, it was 45 seconds back to Zula, so he could well, if he gets a stage victory as well, could uh, probably gather on the minute back when as Tonkov starts to accelerate forward. Has anything left in uh, Pantani's leg? Pantani would love to get the victory, but he's got nothing left. Pantani is struggling here, but the pink jersey won't go down without a fight, and he's done just that now, and so as uh, Tonkov gets the stage victory, yet another stage victory on the right-hand side, watch that screen, because certainly uh, Pantani wanted today to get at least two minutes out of uh, Zula, for two minutes he could take out tomorrow to go into the time trial with a cushion of maybe four or five minutes, but the big thing is I'm not certain that the gap is going to be what Pantani would want, but it may well suit Tonkov as... Uh, Bicelli starts to come in here in all the emotion and excitement of watching the battle between Tonkov, Pantani and Zula. We missed out with the uh, third place man, so there's no time bonus at the moment, but uh, Tonkov has uh, now got an extra 12 seconds to his face. So when you see that 42, 43, whatever the case it is down there, you have to add 12 seconds onto that one. And Zula's coming in now, and Zula is going to be over a minute down on Tonkov, and that is danger zone. He's gone into the red. That's danger zone for Zula. At uh, 56 seconds, that means that it's one minute and eight seconds he has lost on Tonkov. Uh, on the stage today and in that time trial on the stage 15 he was 1 minute and 22 seconds adrift but you also add in the gap that existed this morning uh, of some 31 seconds between Tonkov and Zula and I now make uh, Tonkov is 1 minute and 39 seconds ahead of Alex Zula he's extreme that's he, uh, uh, Graham Watson there below the 129. That's Graham Watson, by the way. And if you're going out to watch the uh, Tour de France in Dublin, you'll see that Graham Watson has got a, an exhibition of his uh, cycling photographs, well worth having a look at uh, if you're over there for the start. I hope you are going to the start in Dublin because we'll be there in force and looking forward to your company. But uh, Graham Watson, who you just saw there, is going to have an exhibition of his work in uh, Dublin. I've lost the bit of paper which says exactly where it's being held, but I'm sure cycling will say where it's going to be held. And you can go and see that one. But back to the race today. One minute, 39 seconds between Zula and uh, Tonkov by virtue of the time bonuses and, uh, and what he had already in, his, in the bag from uh, yesterday. So that is the danger to me. And uh, tomorrow we're going to finish in a very similar way, uphill like you see here. Uh, and uh, Zula has to be careful now, not so much about uh, uh, Pantani, but very much about Tonkov. As Falazin, riding for the MAPE team, starts to come in here, the MAPE Brickaby rider, uh, did a wonderful job today to help Tonkov. All these chaps from MAPE Brickaby, when they come in, you have to respect what they did to keep the race together and let Tonkov uh, ride in to take the stage victory. Uh, Chepe Gonzalez has been going well as the king of the mountains. He's also uh, been enlightening our screens this afternoon, and uh, I hope that you back at home have enjoyed what you've seen uh, brought to you by Eurosport as we now look back then, slow motion. I think we're going to miss Chepe Gonzalez finishing, unfortunately, but uh, certainly Tonkov here, who is re really laying down his cards and saying, not only I've got a victory here, but the fact that he finished second in the Tour of Italy last year, he was first year before that, he's now in tension for overall honours in Milan on Sunday. He's got the power. Look at the way he comes through here. He's not especially as clever like Pantani, but he's got a lot of guts, a lot of determination, and he rides just to win the specialist uh, uh, stage races, and that elation shows it. Not only have I got the victory, but he will know he's narrowed the gap or enlarged the gap between himself and Zula. We're back now with the, the bus, as they call it. This is the riders. These are the riders who are further back down the field who are now struggling in to ride through. They're the domestics. They fetch and carry for their teammates. They keep the race together until they get to the bottom of the mountain, and then they know it's just... Uh, destruction derby day when they go up because they have to fight to stay with it and eventually they get and they hope inside the time limit because they don't give up all that readily by the way you imagine yesterday and i said that look leblanc had stopped three times and his teammates kept coming and saying go on go on lucho keep going and he did so and the same thing bartoli stopped twice uh, twice then went on uh, they all want to finish but there comes a point when you say i just can't i've had enough and you can see the state the riders down here when they're coming across the line look the camera there uh, taking a picture 
of that Rado finish. I've seen Rados come over the line trying to get inside the time limit uh, in stage races, just fall off their bikes across the line. They just get there and collapse, and their, their swanyas, their helpers, come and pick them up and give them drinks of water and uh, make sure they, they get something warm around their backs because it can be very cold up in the mountains as well. You can catch a chill if you're not careful. That's what happened to Pantani, by the way, uh, last year in the Tour de France when he got the stage in the Alpe d'Huez. He got it back to back uh, two years, the Alpe d'Huez he got. Uh, the trouble was that when he finished, although the sun was shining, it was bitterly cold up there, he got a bit of a, a, a chest problem and he struggled the next day before he went on to get his stage victory the day after that. So you, you can if you're not careful. Uh, look at this wonderful ski run here. That's nice, isn't it? I'm sure that my friend David Goldstrom knows all about this. I know nothing about it. <laughs> oh, it's going to be the World Championship in 2003. Oh, have a look at this. David Goldstrom, are you watching? Here we go. Woo! I yeah, like this. Yeah, down we go. Oh, look at the distance. We just set the record. Yeah, that's great, isn't it? See what you get on Eurosport. You can preview of the Winter Olympics or Winter Games as well. <laughs> Brought to you by the benefit of wonderful television and the helicopter man going out there. And just showing you now the uh, position then on the general classification. Tonkov narrow that gap on Pantani. But look back at Zula. This to me is important. Uh, Zula at two minutes and eight to Pantani. No problem. We're quite happy with that. But uh, look where he is then. Zula versus Tonkov because that is going to be tough for the time trial. The rest, by the way, uh, Kammer's in at five minutes and Michelli eight, eleven minutes. Bettini. Okay, forget them for the overall. They, they, they've, they've done a good job. They'll stay with there. But in reality now, the battle is between the man here coming up to win the stage race, Pavel Tonkov. And Zula, and, uh, Zula will try to uh, keep that distance as close as he can do on tomorrow's stage. But Pan can Pantani recover from what was a terrible day yesterday and then uh, another hard day today to punch those extra two or three minutes out? So uh, Tonkov will be watching Pantani like a hawk tomorrow. Zula will be in there too as well. We're watching a battle then between three men as we're going in towards the climax of the uh, Tour of Italy. Tomorrow's going to be very important. The time trial is going to be important. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed watching this uh, sport, even if you aren't into cycling, but uh, you've enjoyed what you've seen so far, and you'll join me, David Duffield, tomorrow for more action from the Tour of Italy. Bye-bye. Arrivederci. Despite the speed on your camera right now, they are on the climb, the big one, the Galetto di Cadino, and uh, already we're getting information coming back up that uh, Zola is still in difficulty, and the Mercato Nuno have really put the pressure on now, whizzing around that bit of a false flat now, back again up onto the hairpin bends, something like 70 kilometers to go, and you can see on the front here, Mercato Nuno, they've had the word that uh, Zola's struggling, and here Konishev, uh, freeze, uh, frozen on your screen at the moment, has gone to the front and really powering this along. There's about 34 or 40 riders behind him and the pale yellow and the uh, turquoisey blue shorts of the Mercator Uno team here and their Bianchi bikes are plowing up this climb and causing enormous havoc behind. Uh, the race this morning, the first uh, three to four hours were pretty flat, not much happening on this stage. We've got 239 kilometres to cover before we get to the end of the stage on this, the 19th stage of the Tour of Italy from Cavalese to Plan di Monte Campione. That's 150 long miles, and uh, they say there's nothing so long in French as a day without bread. Well, poor old uh, Zula here is going to have a really long day in the saddle. He must recover somehow. His teammates have dropped back to him now. The last time check we had was round about 30 seconds, and uh, he is beginning to struggle. Jonas knows what's happened. He just blew a gasket, and there's not a cyclist watching this program, I suppose, who's been racing in his time that has never been has never gone through that sudden patch when what we have called the bonk you suddenly get the bonk and it hits you and you go flying off the back and that's it and uh, you're groveling around looking for sugar oops it He's pumping himself some little oxygen here, I suppose, or something to make him go, because he, he really is in trouble. Eating sugar lumps, grabbing anything you can do to uh, restore your, your legs, go absolutely to water, you go through this phase. But the big thing is about uh, what we call the bonk, I suppose it's like the um, Matherin runners when they hit the, hit the wall, is for riding you can sort of 
go through it, you can come back and your strength comes back again afterwards. It's just riding through it. And the trouble is that not only is it weak in your legs and you feel like somebody's sort of drained every uh, ounce of blood from your body, you know, it's starting to go back through now, but um, you also get psychologically disadvantaged by it. And when you're in a road race and the splits happen now, and over 30 seconds of the gap between you and the man you're trying to chase down, it is very psychologically bad, particularly when you're on a climb like this one, because it is a thumping great climb they're on now. They're going to be 1,943 metres above sea level when they get to the top. And then when they get over the top, they'll be 56 kilometres uh, on towards the finish. So Pantani and his cohorts here have really put the hammer down as far as Zula's concerned, and the Italian's moment has come. I suspect, as I'm looking now at the uh, Festina team, they've got uh, one of the Italian riders here from Mercatone just hovering behind them. This is going to be Italy versus the rest, because see the Festina team are beginning to come back now. That's Vladimir Belli. Although he's an, an Italian, he rides for Festina. He, he has to earn his money uh, looking after his team. So they've been dropping back out of that league group now to look after Zula, who's really gone and hit the wall in no uncertain terms. So we're still, I'd say, nearly 70 kilometres to go to the finish. He has to fight his way up this climb. We've seen him do it before, not yesterday, but the day before. He went through a very bad patch indeed, did uh, Zilla, and then finally recovered, and uh, yesterday didn't look too bad at all, but uh, he's struggling right now. He's not going to get for this lot. Look, they're, they're drifting past him now. The rest of the boys, even these, I would say, secondary riders, but they're making Zula's life intolerable because the riders here that he normally would just be dropping off down the mountainside are drifting past him one by one. And he, so Zula and his teammates now, this is one of his teammates looking back now to see what the damage is being done, looking around to see who, who they've got left. And up in front, then the, the uh, Mercatoluna are really having a field day out here. This is the one that. Uh, the Pantani, the leader in the pink jersey there, has been looking for, and his teammates are rallying round him. I'm a bit surprised, though, they're trying to blast uh, Zula at this particular point, because uh, if Zula recovers and comes back again, uh, it might be, as you see, one or two of the uh, Mercatonuno lads just sliding off the front here. They've got to regroup at the front, and if they ride too hard, Mercatonuno, uh, then they might... Uh, destroy their forces for the final big climb to come because we go up this thumping great climb, the Plan de Monte Capione, uh, at the end of the race, and it's about a 20-kilometer climb. So look at the state of this man's face here. He's gotten half your scream of Padanzana was burying himself here for his teammate. Well, they, they see that Festina look much more relaxed, although uh, Zula on the far side there is uh, grimacing a bit. His teammates round about him aren't too pushed, but look at the state face, this, his face here, eh? Well, we often talk about the domestics and their job, uh, the, what they have to do, and you're seeing it now very much clearly on your screen, on Eurosport, that the Festina team have come back. And look, one by one, of those riders that were with Zul, including some Mercatonuno riders, have drifted up the road. They, he really has to search down. He's got to really pull something out now. He's in trouble. And that is not a good move. That's not good. Zula is shaking his head. He took that drink and threw the bottle away. That, and look, he painted man, come on. Go down the road, I'm OK, just leave me to die. Oh, dear. It reminds me... <laughs> my candle burns at both ends. It gives a glorious light. Oh, my friends and oh, my foes, it will not last the night. And I think he's burnt his candle out now. Poor Zola. Well, Piper has been through this before, and he's now going to fight his way. He said... Uh, to everybody that these mountains in Italy are far worse than the Tour de France, far worse than the Tour of Italy. He's won the Tour of Italy twice, he's been up there battling in the Tour de France as well, and now the Festina rider is taking a right old pasting. He has to stay within about three minutes of Pantani uh, to pull back the time on the time trial the day after tomorrow, but Pantani's teammates here are really giving him some stick. I'm just watching to see, it's, you get little nuances from a rider when you see like his, his reaction then as to how they're feeling. 
Um, psychologically, he's got to find his own battle because physically he's gone through a bad patch. He can come back, um, but he has to fight. He just can't give up at this stage and say, oh, blow it, I'm going to get on, jump a bike and go back down the hill and go home. He's got to fight on through this, just hoping he can stay in contention as he goes past Coppolillo of the Azic CGA team. His team manager is coming up now to try and give him some form of encouragement. But look at this lot up in front now. The race has really ripped apart the scene. And the man who's benefiting uh, must be Tonkov. I see that looks like Kijani Bonio going through to the front of the group now. So Mape are also aiding this chase, which says to me that Tonkov is nicely placed in that group as well. Gosh, this is something different. If you watched our programme this morning when we had three hours on Eurosport when they were just getting ready for this particular part of the course, I'm sorry there wasn't much action down there because we had hoped with we there for three hours that some lively soul might disappear down the road and take a small group with him. It's happened before when some of the people who are 15, 20 minutes, even half an hour or one hour down decide that their day of glory might come if they clop off down the road. But I think there's so many tired legs in this race because uh, we're now on the Thursday of the race. It is Thursday, isn't it? I think it is. Anyway, it's... So uh, now on whatever day it is, stage uh, uh, 19 of the Tour of Italy. And they've covered so far 3,290 kilometres in this race. So that's uh, going to be 2,000 miles I've actually ridden since they started out on the uh, Tour of Italy, uh, on the race proper on uh, Sunday just over, what, two and a half weeks ago. And here's Gianni Bugno on the front. What a tremendous character this man is. He won this race in 1990. He's working very hard for Mappe. And also at the moment, it looks like Italy versus the rest as Mappe and Mercato Nudo trying to smash Silla out of sight. This is a tremendous uh, piece of uh, riding by the Mercato Nudo team, aided and abetted by the Mappe squad to try and blast uh, p uh, the Silla boys back down the, the mountainside. The gap is growing all the time. The last time check we had, it was at, uh, at 30 seconds. By the looks of the way it's going now, it must be growing all the way up uh, on this climb now. So, what's it going to be by the time we get to the top? Because once you get over there, there were just 56 kilometres to go, uh, and then straight on down into the uh, uh, the depths of the valley before the long uh, 20 kilometres up toward the finish. So there's some distance yet uh, for the recovery of Zola. That's Now that's interesting. That was a bottle handed up by one of the helpers of the Mercator Nono team, and uh, they passed it back, and Bunyo, a sort of nice gentleman that he is, took hold of the bottle and passed it back down on it. Go watch this again. said earlier on that it looks like Italy versus the rest at the moment and certainly Bugno here riding hard with the uh, Mercator Nuno team. I'm, I'm surprised he's gone up there to push it quite so much because uh, as we've now got a freeze frame, I'm sorry we seem to be losing the picture through the, through the trees, but um, uh, his main man is Tonkov and uh, if you haven't caught up with some of our programmes this morning or what's been happening in the press, the overall position as we go in now, oh, 1.30, 1 minute 30 is a gap back to Zola. This is going to make life very difficult indeed for him because he's start out this morning uh, Pantani in the pink jersey uh, was um, uh, 27 seconds ahead of uh, Pavel Tonkov who rides to the Mappe Breakaway team same team as that of uh, uh, Gianni Bugno uh, after the result we had yesterday uh, Giuseppe Guarini from the Polti team was at 1 minute 47 seconds on general classification and Alex Zuller who is now one and a half minutes back as at this morning he started out in fourth spot two minutes and eight seconds back and I felt that if Alex could get to the finish no more than three, four minutes away from Pantani. He could still win the race by the time trial on Saturday, but now he's lost the ground and we still haven't got over the top of this climb as a big one yet to come. I'm sorry we keep losing the pictures. There are problems getting it up from the uh, motorcycle through the trees, you see, up to the helicopter and then beamed onto the aircraft that flies in circles above the helicopter to boost the pictures on down to the satellite dishes in the start-finish area. Then off they go back up into the sky so you could see them at home. So modern technology works well until you get a tree in the way, an old-fashioned tree. So uh, disappointment then for Alex Zuller to be now uh, in excess of uh, three and a half minutes down. He can't afford to lose any more time on this climb and uh, the 
uh, Mercado Nuno team are having an absolute field day in this glorious weather. It's been an absolute superb day so far. A bit, a bit nothing to begin with. The first three hours they just rolled along and uh, nothing much happened until we've now started on this climb. And really the whole proverb has hit the fan. You can see the mountain in the background. It is a tremendously hard uh, course for the riders today because they're going to cover these 239 kilometres. That's 150 miles as far as they're concerned in the saddle. And you can see the, 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 the stress of it already showing on the face of these riders. What a way to earn a living. And by the way, they enjoy it. <laughs> you have to be, you have to enjoy cycling to suffer like this. And a lot of blokes are suffering. But some of these chaps here further at the back are getting a nice little toe because Mercatonuno are putting the pressure on the front and at the back of that little group there we just saw a trunk up of the Belan team before our freeze frame picks up until we pick our picture back up again of the Mercatonuno rider who's taking an awful pasting at the moment as Palenzani. He's 36 years of age by the way. He looks about 56 you tell me. Well that may be so. And he's 15th overall in general class occasion that's not his main aim of being in the race it's to look after Pantani most of the cyclists it is recognized look about 10 years younger than they actually are but right now they're looking about 10 years older and this man here looks like he's looking for a hearse poor don't spit at me poor Zulu's in all sorts of states isn't he he must have heard me oh dear I know many people watch uh, Psycho on Eurosport who don't know the first thing about bike racing. And you can always feel for somebody in pain like that, but you know, sometimes, like Pantani here, they make it look so easy, don't they? They've got the climbs, and um, oh, his teammate here is, is absolutely working his socks off and suffering. That uh, the, the, the pressure that they race under, the, the, the effort to stay at an average speed, which they've uh, done until uh, today, an average speed of just under 25 miles an hour for some 2,000 miles of racing, without a day off, what have you, up these climbs you see here. Um, it, we often see just the front of the race with the big boys bashing away, but other riders further back down are taking an even almighty pasting, but they've got to, oops, two and minutes and five seconds now. This is the danger zone. This is the red light zone as far as uh, Zola's concerned he's got to just stay 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 cool and stay there on the descent he's a pretty good descender well okay okay I know he's fallen off a few times but it's dry today so Zola will go down the other side like a bat out of hell uh, to try and redress any balance that's gone at the top of it but he has to recover uh, at some point on the descent because there's this thumping great climb we've got at the end of it all 20 kilometers of climbing that's about uh, just over 10 miles taking them up from uh, 205 uh, um, meters above sea level to 1750 so they're going to climb 1500 meters on the way up uh, towards the top of the climb that's about four and a half thousand feet and i don't think i don't even think that snowden's as tall as that uh, starting down at sea level so they've got to go straight up this big climb at the end of it all and pantani must be licking his proverbial lips uh, in joy now that he could be getting rid of zula who is his is bete noir when it comes to the uh, uh, the, the time trial, but he has to do something about Tonkov because Tonkov romped away yesterday, grabbed the stage victory. Uh, Pantana, you see there in the pink. If you go back past the two yellow jerseys, that white one there is the jersey of, uh, of Pavel Tonkov, who was second last year in the Tour of Italy and first the year before. So he's, a, he's also won the Tour of Spitzen. He's a very good, uh, a competent all rounder. He can time trial, he can climb, he can ride on the flat, can, uh, Panta, uh, can uh, Tonkov, but he preserves his whole efforts uh, for the big tours he's not a man that you find riding with any venom when it comes to the big stage races or the all the short distance ones but hello we've got a man away that's one of the screen riders that's gone away now well there are not many of them left by the way it's been a war of attrition in the last uh, couple of days we had 34 riders the other day outside the time limit which thinned down the field and Pantani did the damage that day and Ackleson's gone off down the road it is him yes got the information coming up it's Axelson that's gone from the Screeno team well the Screeno team are down now to uh, just five riders they've lost Conti, Casarato, Rosato and Patachi and all those names I just mentioned, mentioned you are the people who can win stages through sprinting and breaking away towards the end uh, so they really are thin on the ground at the moment the uh, the Screeno again they often uh, 
they're the pirates as far as I'm concerned. Every race I watch and I see the Screeno team taking part, I thought, ah, they're going to pinch a few stages here because they're opportunists. They don't race for overall victory. They just wait until something is right. And down the road they go and they grab a stage victory and that's the way they operate. They're not a, a well-heeled uh, team. They're not loaded with lots of money. They don't buy big star riders. So what you see here is with uh, they, they bought Zula, the uh, Festina team. They, fight, they hired him this year specifically to win the Tour of Italy, to sell Festina watches in in, uh, in Italy or help sell the, the watches in Italy and so uh, on these circumstances all the riders you see now going around Zola giving him psychological support keeping away from the wind making sure that uh, if he wants a drink he gets one that they're there to urge him on giving encouragement and so that's the sort of thing that happens with a team where they have a big leader who costs a lot of money now the Scrigno Gan team they don't really have any leader they, they start the, at the start of the day with a rough idea of who's going to do well that day because who's in form and they sit over breakfast and say well my legs feel awful today and the other chap said well, I'm feeling good and they say okay we'll see if you can win today uh, and they go into a race and they wait and if it, the heat's on and some of the top teams are knocking spots off each other you don't find the screen again team up there they wait for their opportunity and bang they pounce and uh, they haven't had the stage victory they were looking for so far in this race normally they get at least one in the two of sometimes a couple but it's been hard fought race so far and uh, right now they send Axelson Duff down the road, the lanky legged fella. So let's see what he can do with this one. While the rest are going pretty quickly, it seemed to me a, a rather. Um I thought it's stupid is the wrong word, but it looks like a, a, an attempt by the Swede to do something which is a bit uh, over the top when you think that Pantani and the Mercatan Uno and the Mappe team are about to try and rip the legs off Zula. I'd have thought the best thing to do is keep your powder dry and wait to the final climb, but he's clocked off down the road. He may pay for it later on by falling off in the big heat when he gets to the top of this climb because uh, he might have just chosen the wrong time to go. We shall see. All will be revealed on Eurosport. And I hope you're enjoying our coverage through the second half today. We start this morning, I'll say, for three hours, nothing happened, except I had to talk for three hours. I hope I didn't bore you people back at home. I did the best to keep the pot boiling, but I was looking for something like this, one man to pop off down the road, and here he is. Look, 40th overall, 43-48. Um, there's no way that he's a threat to the uh, uh, pink jersey, but they're moting quite quickly. When you think about how he'd gone away from the, the pink jersey, where Zula's going backwards, that is a complete contrast between the two, and he's not unlike Zula. He's a long, lanky-looking fellow here with uh, thinnish legs, quite reasonable size. And no, I'm not like that. It's just that you, you look at some bike riders with little spindly calf muscles and reasonable size, and you think, ah, oh, he can push the pedals down well. Little arms, so he hasn't got much weight there. And big lungs, a bit like Mr. Uh, Fausto Coffey was my idol, as you know. <laughs> Everybody knows that over the years. So this fellow's built somewhat the same, but a bit taller than the Bolt House. So again, look at his, his uh, slim calves, and he's got reasonably slim thighs too. So he's not pushing much weight up this climb. Now, I don't know a lot about him because. Um, He's only turned pro uh, during uh, 1997, and he didn't get any victories towards the back end. He's what they call a stagiaire, so the, uh, the Screeno people have picked him up uh, very quickly indeed. Bunyo back on the front here, and Mercatanuno still behind him in the yellow and uh, celeste blue shorts and on their Bianchi celeste blue bicycles. So this is a bonanza day for Mappe and uh, uh, Mercatanuno. And yeah, Bruno just had a little check but further back down the road. And he moved over a bit quick there, nearly bang it, ran into the chap behind him. And here he goes again. Now, the, I saw this fellow, well, he's back again. Went, I've got a boy, because um, I keep talking about going off to Malaysia in February, uh, as I did for the, uh, the tour of Langkawi. And he rode. Uh, the, the time trial, the first day, was a time trial. It was, it was fairly well up till to the finish, the hotel we were staying at. Uh, Taffy of the Mappe team won it. Uh, Brian Walton from the Saturn American team was second. He won the English milk race a few years ago. Uh, and Axelson was, was third on that day. So the chap you're looking at now, the long lanky fellow, uh, it certainly showed his, uh, his performance on that day. It was very hot and humid. We got around about, it was around about 35 degrees, it was. And uh, despite the heat, and he comes from Sweden, you'd think he'd be cooking, wouldn't you, as a Swede, not used perhaps to those temperatures. He romped away on that climb and finished a third, and he held a place in the top five for an awful long time. So we'll try and pick him up later on, see how he's going, as the Mercatone Uno team aren't hanging about at the moment, so Mr. Ackleson's uh, moment of glory at the front might be under threat of the way these chaps are riding. And look at the complete contrast in style, because these are diddle bike riders, around about five foot, uh, uh, five to five foot seven, maybe five foot eight maximum. And this fellow's got to be uh, the thick end of, of, of six foot. I say he's a new pro on the block. I'm sorry, we lost the picture again there, but you can see the entirely different uh, style. Except he is 
quite like a yard of pump water, fairly lightweight uh, character when it comes to his size, and he's drifting away, he's going even further away now at the moment. Well, there they are. They're also known, by the way, the, the MAPE team, because apart from uh, um, the actual performance he did that day, Mr Glear, who's riding in this race at the moment for the, the MAPE team, won over all the Tour of Lankawi between Feb 18 and March the 1st, a 12-day race there, and uh, Figueres, his teammate, uh, was in uh, second spot, and Ackleson, in the end, finished third overall, so he's quite well known to the, the uh, MAPE team, but as he's 40th overall, they're not going to be too bothered about the performance that he's uh, showing at the moment. They're going some very, very narrow roads, and uh, it's a sort of gradual climb upwards. It isn't one of those back-breaking, short... Uh, jobs where you get a sort of 20% of stuffed in the middle of it. It's a, it's a good steady climb all the way up and I think he's probably chosen just the right thing to do to go away on this one. And there he is and the gap I think is opening up now as we go to a short break. Stay with us. Jeremy Bono undoubtedly is doing a tremendous job today in trying to pull back uh, this uh, lone leader. I don't think they're too concerned about Axelson uh, going on to take the King of the Mountains prize at the top here. They're just determined to try and uh, spit Mr uh, Zola out of the background. So we've got a very interesting race for you today on Eurosport. One new pro on the block. And look at the gap now, 3 minutes 25 seconds. Zola must be dying a thousand deaths back there. Oh, golly, is this the end of it all now? They had... Um, in the uh, Gazette de la Sport, a cartoon when Zilla in uh, Trieste just stamped on everybody's head and won, I mean, about three minutes and 20 odd seconds he beat be Pantani by, and they had him sort of riding along with his with his cloak on his hat and a, like a big Z of Zorro was written in the sky, and like he was just going to chop everybody's heads off with his sword as he rode into the distance and won the Tour of Italy. Well, my goodness, how things change in such a short space of time. Uh, it, I've said a lot of my programmes, if you've been watching uh, the cycling and getting mixed up with the tennis, that uh, uh, the big seeds have been dropping out of the tennis uh, Roland Garros in Paris, and I've been catching up with bits of that from time to time. And in cycling, we've had the same thing. Uh, Gotti, the winner last year of the Tour of Italy, has dropped out now. He had stomach trouble following a viral infection, and that's put paid to his, uh, his hopes and ambitions. We had Bartoli, who'd had the Chiclamina jersey finish outside the time limit. He was chucked out as well. So a lot of people have been up to now uh, being given the axe or the chop and uh, now suddenly it looks as if um as Axelson's going away still at the front, that Zilla is in great difficulty and could well go down a bit further on general classification. Now, this is what bike racing is all about, and that's why I know many of you like watching big tours, because every day it unfolds, and we've seen, for instance, uh, Cipollini, the sprinter who took four stages in the race so far, knock it on the head the other day when it came to the mounds. He just couldn't stand the, the pace. I don't know whether he was sick or whether he just had enough, but he went home to count his money and his shirts and his shoes, I suppose, and to take his puma for a walk or ride his horse, whatever he's gone back now. Uh, so we'll have a different victory in uh, Milan as regards the uh, the final stage, because that has been his speciality in the past. And so the race has been, really now been whittled down. We've only got some 98 riders left as at this morning from the, the, the teams that started in this race because the full complement lined up at Nice for the start. We had 18 teams by nine men. There's 162 riders. And now we're down to just 98 as at this morning. I fear after today's efforts in these final eight 80 kilometres, the last 50 miles, the whole thing has blown apart at the seams, that a few more are going to be outside the time limit, and uh, that will reduce uh, tremendously the cost of the organisation in hotel bills, because a lot of these riders will be going home. Not these you see here, because this is the, the front group, and behind the Festina a group is a little race on its own, trying to narrow that gap down or keep it as close as they can do. So it's, it's really great stuff on these climbs. Where are you, I hear, uh, so where are we, I hear you ask, because uh, I did give the location of the race when we started this morning, but if you were at work and didn't pick up with it, or if uh, you wanted to do something else like mow the lawn or do the washing up or the ironing or went out shopping, whatever you were doing this morning, then uh, uh, we came down this morning on the start of the race in a due southerly direction. And uh, I know some people get their maps out to see where we're going to and from. We started out this morning and we ran down. If you look on your maps at the, uh, at the bits where you can see See Venice, Padova, Verona and Brescia in a straight line from, from east to west. Uh, then 
Uh, as you get to Verona, you look north up from there, there's a something great autostrada goes up um, to the to Trento and then up to a place called Bozzano, where we were there yesterday. Now, Trento, we're to the left-hand side of Trento. The, the race now has come uh, virtually parallel to that, um, that, that uh, autostrada. And I'm sure on any map, even if it's your old grubby thing with uh, the, the sort of... The, the edges all, all faded over the years. The Lago di Garda, which is the uh, the big lake which you can see between Verona and Brescia that goes right up towards uh, the uh, River di Galgada. We came across the top of that, the River di Garda, this morning, went through a tunnel which was uh, two miles long, by the way, so we lost all the pictures while the riders were going through the two-mile tunnel and the cameras just flicked around and looked at the beautiful countryside and the vineyards and uh, what have you. So we've come down. If you can find that big uh, lake on your, on your map, we've come past the, the top end of that and we're on the left hand side that we're going out towards the left and heading out towards that little lot there we also this morning on the way down uh, came alongside a group of mountains and on the left hand side they were called Mount Gaza G A double Z A yes yes the uh, very famous footballer who must be now spitting nails because he's not been selected due to his, his fitness so he's not uh, playing for England in the World Cup which as you know all 64 games on Eurosport phenomenal amount of football coming up something like 12 hours a day of it. And by the way, cycling's in the middle of it. They won't forget cycling. They're good, these Eurosport people. They, they're letting us cover the Tour of Switzerland. It might get mucked about a bit because of the... Um of the timing of the football games, but uh, hang on in there. Uh, I'm not sure what time this is going out, uh, the, the programme you're seeing now, because we record bits and then stuff it out on air to people, so it, um, it, it goes out at various times, but we're certainly going to do what we can to keep a bit of cycling going during the, uh, uh, the, the, the World Cup. And, of course, on the final weekend of the World Cup, on the Saturday and Sunday, when uh, all the whistles are blowing, the bells are going, and everybody's getting all woke up, but we should be in uh, Dublin for the start of the Tour of France. Yes, it's in Dublin. I hope you booked your tickets to go there. And if you're worried about missing the World Cup, don't worry, we're not going to be on air at the time when the World Cup's on. They've, they've, they've got the time scales for the prologue on the Saturday and the, the uh, stage race on the Sunday. So when we finish, you can actually then go and watch the football too. So we're going to have a great time in uh, Dublin. But look at this, isn't that magnet? This is what the big tours are all about, climbing the mountains. And this is where... Not always the mountain climbers win the race overall, but they really give the people looking for overall victory a right good thrashing. And the enthusiasm of the spectators is plain to see. All these people have come up. There's, there's practically nothing round here, little villages, so these people have come from far and wide. And the big thing about the Tour of Italy, again, is the uh, whole range of the Alps and Dolomites. They lie across this uh, great band of uh, industrial parts of uh, Italy and big cities too, so they can come out, they can knock off work. I mean, loads of these people today, they've, they've found good reasons not to be at work, to come out and spend the day in the sunshine watching these riders on this tremendous climb. Here we go. There'll be people on the side of the road who will be hearing that Axelson's in the lead. They'll say Axel who because he won't be well known to these people at all. But they just applaud the sheer endeavour and the guts and determination of these riders who've now covered over 2,000 miles since we started off just over two and a half weeks ago. And look at the mountain in the background. The snow is still up there. And they've been riding at nearly 25 miles on average speed for those uh, last 2,000 miles. And you can admire their stamina, their courage, their endurance and their tenacity to tackle these something great mountains. Axelson looking to take the first time I know in a big big uh, tour he looks like he's going to take uh, King of the Mountain his prize when he goes over here there's a special prize every time they go over the top of the big climbs and he's going up now to take this one the Calato de Cadillo he's going to get 10 points in the King of the Mountain's competition that won't really worry him he's not in contention for the green jersey if it would fit him because he's a big bloke anyway but he's going to get 1 million lira for crossing the top of the mountain in first spot Quo, he's a millionaire already I think you can knock most of the noughts off it. I'm just waiting for the day when the Euro comes along. It's going to make it so much easier because the riders get fined in Swiss francs. We get uh, liras here. By the time you keep changing your pounds into this and back again and something else, you, your head spins and you say, oh, well, let's look at the noughts and the lot in, in, uh, in Italy. So all the multi-millionaires are going to find their lifestyle change when they switch to the Euro. But there he goes. A million uh, lira is facing him on the top of the climb and 10 points in the Kingdom of But... Uh, Oh, no! I don't believe it. 
Um, I don't think Bunyo did either. Uh, it's not a good thing, by the way, to go out to these mounds and start uh, giving riders drinks. But if you do, there is Bunyo goes through now, and uh, Chevy Gonzalez behind him, who's looking for some points, thinking about what's that. See, see the fellow in the pink thing there who offered uh, a bottle of water. Uh, the riders will take it. They don't often drink it because you never know. Someone else spiked the thing and put something in there which is very naughty. Uh, so what you do is you, they, most of the water they take, they, they pump on their heads to keep themselves cool. And as it goes over now, the time clock starts to run. If you do hand bottles up, it's a bit illegal, by the way, but the whole art is that you, you put your hand back, as that fellow did, and as the rider goes through, you start to run and you move your arm up with him. So actually the bottle is going a trajectory equal to the speed of the rider. If you just hold it still, pow, it bounces out of his hand. There's no way you can grab it in that mini second when the bottle's hung out. So the, the whole thing is to get the bottle and put your hand backwards, start to run, and then as he comes up, swing your hand forward so that he actually travels, the bottle travels at the rate of the rider. That's that, what we saw there was not the way to do it. Lecture over. Oh, Chevy Gonzalez powering away to the front here now. He's uh, trying to take that green jersey off for, Cla off for Pantani. And he's gone over the top in uh, second spot at 44 seconds. So Chevy in the green, 44 seconds back on Axelson. So he's going to get himself uh, uh, six points in the King of the Mountains competition. And Pantani was probably... I don't know if we get a replay, I missed that one. Probably about uh, three places back as they now go on the descent. This is the, uh, the heart-stopping moment when everybody follows everybody else and hopes that nobody goes over the edge or they all fall off the end. But uh, uh, going back to the King of the Mountains competition, the, the green jersey being worn by Chepe Gonzalez is not because he's leading on that competition, it's because uh, uh, Pantani is the overall leader on the King of the Mountains competition. But he can't wear the pink and the green jersey, so what they do is they pass down to the second place man the jersey, and so it's on the shoulders at the moment of Chevy Gonzalez, who started out this morning in second place on the uh, King of the Mountains competition. And there he is, following Pickley down. Pickley leading on the points competition. Oh! God! Oh! I'm searching my notes to see what's. What the, what the points difference is on the King of the Mountains competition for, Pan, for Pantani and Chevy Gonzalez. Now look up, there's one of the riders from the Mercator Uno team sliding out. I wonder what happened there. I'm sorry I didn't see it. I was uh, trying to get you up to updated on the King of the Mountains competition, but uh, as the Mappe team start to plough away here on the front, that's Kamazin in the red jersey, champion of Switzerland. Uh, we know we've seen Bunyo doing a great job too as well, but uh, that was nearly a nasty one which could have wiped out a fair number of riders, and uh, goodness knows what happened, because it's, it's not wet, there's Pantani, he was out of uh, harm's way. Pulling his jersey down, see how he's being followed, here we go again, good, I'm glad they've got action right. There's Gonzalez in the green, goes round the corner, a bit wide, they're not very good corner uh, uh, descenders, the Colombians, then we get the pink jersey of Pantani, then ten times, whoops, he's gone, his back wheel seemed to go. That's interesting, I wonder if he punctured because he lost complete control of his back wheel when it shouldn't have normally... As you watch the way the others are coming round here, they're about the same sort of angle. Uh, he might well have punctured just coming in there. Once you've punctured, it, pss, all the air goes out because they've got about 100 pounds worth of pressure into those tyres. They go straight onto the, onto the very narrow aluminium rim and there's no way you can bank your bike with uh, no air in the tyre. So perhaps he punctured uh, just going as he banked his bike over and that was the reason that suddenly he found himself uh, base over apex, but I don't think any damage was done. The way he sort of slipped sideways, he didn't sort of break anything. He, his, his pride was hurt more than his body. So um, it looks like he should be back again. And of course, Pantani is going to need all... Here, we're watching it again as he goes around this corner. And he's going to lose completely. Yes, the back end goes. That's it. Well down the climb now, and this big string of riders begin to regroup, but still in difficulty, Alex Suller at the top of the climb. The groups are coming over, and he's really been struggling to stay with his pack here, and uh, certainly uh, with the Mappe team and the Mercosur Nuno team driving this one on for the benefit of the pink jersey there of uh, Pantani, who's got a big problem, really, because the other chap just behind him in the whitish-coloured uh, jersey, that's... Uh, Tomkov, who got the stage victory yesterday. Tomkov can time, uh, can climb. Uh, Tomkov can time trial, and he's doing nothing now except follow Pantani's wheel all the way through. You will not see. Um 
as I say that, Tonkov starts to go up alongside Pantani. I guess you will not see Tonkov uh, go ahead of Pantani probably until they get to the final climb today because his, his total ambition will be to stay with Pantani and then when he thinks Pantani is weakening or his teams are weakened, he'll, he'll have a go at them. But on this descent, off the top of the climb, whistling down here, um, he will be happy, I think, just to stay on board and make sure he doesn't fall off on the way down will be both Pantani, Tonkov and the rest of them and be very careful chaps on these tight bends. We've already seen uh, one of the Mercosur Uno riders take a, a drop. Once they go around, you see, suddenly on the, as they come out, they have to accelerate fast and to close those gaps down. And then they're, they're going so quickly they have to uh, sit back on the brakes. Round we go. These aren't bad, these hairpins, by the way, because they're, they're quite nicely sculpted. Sometimes, on the inside where they're turning around now, that's the steepest part. Sometimes they drop very steeply there, and if you're not careful, you come on the inside, your front wheel drops down, and, and you're, like, you're, you're losing control, and you're grabbing the brake, you can always go straight over the top. It's, uh, this is a very, very well-engineered road, this one, and they're coming down quite nicely. You can use all the roads, swing out, cross the apex, and round out the other side without a great deal of trouble. Can you imagine, though, in the years gone by, when this race first started in 1909, that some of the roads they were going over were just gravel patches and they had to ride up these disgusting gravelly roads full of dust and what have you and come down the other side when you could skid and slide all over the place. And if you punctured with no cars to help you, you had to put your tyres back on yourself, uh, you had no assistance on the way through. It was just amazing the, the uh, feats of strength and endurance of those riders. But now it's all much more, more sophisticated, much more controlled the way the teams race. And here you've got uh, on Eurosport, look at that. I don't know another sport where the people taking part in it are going through countryside like we see here. They're getting paid to do it. Uh, they don't see much of the scenery, do they? Uh, they got a chance of earning some money as well. They got a chance also of falling off. They're not careful, but it's uh, absolutely gorgeous out here today. Brilliant uh, racing conditions. Absolutely superb. Thank goodness it's not raining because a drop, the descent like this one, could be very nasty indeed. The speed they're coming down there. Is Gianni Bugno, using all his skill and experience, twice world champion, winner of the. Uh, tour of Italy way back in 1990. Leads the pack down. That man is brilliant. He doesn't have to race, by the way. He's at an age now. He's got enough money stuffed in the bank, but he's so keen to stay in the sport. I think next year... Oh! <laughs> Stop now, because I've just realised we're back with the bus. This is the, the group of riders who've been shelled out on that climb. Now, um, at the early part of today, and uh, I, I think I mentioned before in the programme, if we haven't had any edited out, was that uh, we had a, uh, the first three or four hours where nothing much happened and the field was all together, what's left it, because we've got 98 riders anyway. And suddenly now, as we started to go up over this climb, a lot of riders here in distance, look how far back they are. That one long climb we've had, uh, first of all, the one that the uh, Fadilla uh, Paganella, when Piccoli took that one ahead of Simone Gonzalez, that wasn't bad after 61 kilometres, and they regrouped on the way down, but already the bus is forming at the back and the uh, information on the uh, uh, radio tour by the way is that Zula has gone over the top of the climb for some reason we haven't had that one picked up he went over at six minutes and 20 seconds down yes I'll say it again six minutes 20 seconds down on uh, Axelson, and Axelson over the top of the climb had about 47 seconds over Chepi Gonzali. Piccoli was in the third spot. So right now, Zula at 6.20 has got to descend like a stone as the bus goes over the top now, and there must be the thick end of nine minutes in arrears. None of these riders, though, will be any great uh, concern about their job. They've done their job to keep the race together at the bottom of it, although we have seen one or two uh, people sliding down the general classification. And there it is. There's the confirmation that we had coming up on race radio that 6.20 it is uh, for Zula uh, back from the pink jersey. He has to do something almighty to uh, catch up on the way through. So whilst Axel is going down here, let me just... Um, let you know what happened yesterday if you didn't uh, see all our program or at least if you saw it but did, didn't know what happened to some of the, the chats further back because when, when we get off air we can't always tell you the whole story um, we had on the, on the class more general one or two people dropping out of the frame after yesterday's stage Falcone was seventh at uh, nine minutes and two seconds 
as I keep my eye on this rider and tell you what was going on. Dropped to 18th yesterday at 24 minutes and 10 seconds. So I'm just waiting for the... Here we go, round the corner. I'll stay with us a moment because it gives you some idea of what it's like taking the bike down. See, as I told you, once you go around the bend, you accelerate again, get the bike up to maximum speed, keep the gap there so you're on the back wheel of the man in front. You can't allow the gaps to open up, otherwise you miss the slipstream. You've got to get back in there quick then. See the quick flick of the gear lever on the right-hand side, getting into the, into the gears, into another gear, then back down again in the slipstream. They'll be doing a steady 50 miles an hour right now. Now they've got the speed up, what's happened, they're just softly turning the pedals now because um, when you get in the big gear and you can get the thing going, it, it goes, once you get to a certain point you can't go any faster, you'll sit there, let it drift down, take the corners, curb to curb, and see the gaps, little one, one, two, one or two riders by the way, are, are brilliant descenders, I mean Stephen Roche uh, was an extremely good and very fast descender on a bike, he could just take uh, uh, a lot of time on the way down and once the gaps opening up now because some riders uh, uh, Sean Yates from another one can just go down because he was a big heavy bloke anyway and the big blokes are better going down because they've got more weight Pantani uh, isn't very good on descent because he's not very heavy he's about uh, seven stone or seven and a half stone or thereabouts and see Axelson has opened up a gap now on the descent he's opened a gap now one minute he's a bigger bloke than Pantani so on the way down he's got more weight to take him down and see the gaps opening up now this is because the, uh, some of the riders are either are scared or not very good when it comes to, to banking the bike round. They go around a bit like a 50 pence piece. They, they take it in sort of straights and straights and straights like that. Um, you have to be very smooth and flow, and some riders can smooth and flow. Uh, another demon descender is uh, Claudio Chiapucci. He can come down and he can just drop people on a descent because he takes all sorts of risks. And now, uh, as Pantani starts to move through, not the world's greatest descender, but pretty smooth. He just dropped inside, I think it's Michelli just in front of him. He's a little devil, isn't he? He's really winding this one up because going down the mountain is often a time to just recuperate and uh, get your breath back. But on the information that uh, he will have got at the top that uh, Zula was further down, he won't know now Zula's 620 because on the descent here, the motorcycle that comes along with a, a, a black ball with the, the time gap on just will keep out of the way. And uh, often we had troubles on the descents with the riders going down faster than the motorcycles. Even our own cameras were spending more time up there in the sky with a helicopter because the motorcycle can't often go down. Oh, <laughs> he's got over the edge for a minute. The motorcycle can't often go down as quick as the rider. You can hear the motorcycle. Can you hear on your on yours? Uh, um, Loud speakers at home. I don't think if the speakers are picking up the what we call international sound, but you get the motorcycle and rev into the stay with Axelson. And we're back then with Furlan with this little camera which is perched on his seat tube and a little transmitter stuffed at the back which is coming up into the sky as well to picked up by a helicopter. See, they can't practice. This fellow, Ax uh, Axelson, he's only turned pro last year. It, he was, uh, what they call it, a, a new pro at the back end of the year. So it's his first full season. He has no chance of, of knowing these roads. Um, Zilla's been out training on some of these roads to know exactly what the climbs are like and also what the ascents are like. But you get some riders in the race who are, who are new to it, and not only new to the route they're taking, but haven't ridden with other riders like this before. And Axelson is throwing all caution to the wind and he's doing a superb job because he's actually going away from some very experienced riders. chain on the outside, the big ring, around about a 53 tooth on the outside he'll have, and he'll have it on about the 11 top tooth as well. Look how, how his legs are flying around here, he just can't pedal any faster. 
Every map for itself, isn't it? They're coming down in penny numbers now. Those who are <coughs> proverbially <coughs> themselves, you know, are taking it a bit easier, and the rest are out there going like this. In fact, there's a little group in between that. That's uh, Piccoli, and we've got another, I think, Salvadelli, who are trying to close a gap down. So information coming across now that we've got a little chase group here behind Axelson. It's Piccoli and... Uh, and Salvadelli, and there they are at the moment. They prize themselves off the front of that uh, group, which uh, I thought was being led by uh, Pantani, but they managed to get away. So they are a couple of knotty descenders as well. They must, uh, if Axelson gets those two with them, with him, it will certainly aid his uh, chance of staying away on the flatter part. Because coming to the bottom of the valley now, and there is a big string chasing along. They're not too bothered about Axelson. He's so far down on general classification. Their whole activity here is to punch more and more time between themselves and Zola at the back, who really is sweating cobs now, beginning to get a, a bit concerned about the gap, which the last time check we had was 6 minutes and 20 seconds. I don't think Zola will lose much on the descent, uh, although he can get a bit nervous at times, and when it's wet, has been known to fall off. But uh, I think when we get to the bottom of this uh, descent, it should be round about 6.5 minutes, perhaps the worst, uh, the gap that he will have between him. And then when we do get down, it starts to be flat, round about a place called Bieno. There'll still be something like 38... Uh, kilometers to go to the finish. Pantani, Tonkov, Kamazin, what a stage is set as they get up toward the top of this climb then, uh, well, 20 kilometers to go from the top of the climb, and really the devastation back further down the pack uh, with uh, Zula still trailing and the gap going all the time, 8 minutes and 20 seconds means that uh, right now Pantani and Tonkov have their own personal private battle uh, on this final climb of the day up to the top of the Plan de Monte Campione. Uh, back in the pack uh, was Axelson being caught now by this group and the other two chaps, Salvador, uh, Deli and Piccoli, so are all together here and what a good ride Axelson did by taking the Intigaro 2 and the top of the that last climb as Pantani starts to accelerate and set about this climb here. Brilliant performance by his uh, Marcus Onuno team. They looked after him all the way through. It's a battle of Pantani versus Tonkov with 20 kilometers to go now. These two riders have the uh, uh, the Tour of Italy in their back pocket. It's going to be between these two, unless of course one of them blows an enormous gasket and goes back down the mountain to join Zilla, who's now days of glory and pink jersey in Milan must have been have evaporated on this tremendous 19 stage of the Tour of Italy. Who would have thought it? But Zula would crack. He was the star favourite for the race. He looked so dominant all the way through, but today has been disaster day for Zula on these 239 kilometres. That's 150 miles. Started slowly. Not much action early on, but once they really started to go up the climb of the Coletto di Cadino, when Axelson went away over the top, ahead of Chepi Gonzalez, who's on your screen now, trying to close a gap for the green jersey competition. But Pantani and Tonkov have left him at the moment. Well, who wears the green jersey? Chepi Gonzalez, he's lying second on the competition, and the man in the pink, uh, Pantani, is the leader. But uh, there's a big fight back coming now at the moment. The only man who can stay there and look about what's going on, he's trying to fight his way up to them, and that looks like Garini at the moment, trying to get up there to join the leaders. He's uh, third overall at 1 minute and 47 seconds, but uh, uh, he's way off the pace, and these two really... Uh, if Pantani can't get rid of Tonkov, he's in trouble, because this morning they started out... Marco Pantani, 27 seconds ahead of Pavel Tonkov, and we have the day after tomorrow, the time trial, and Pavel Tonkov is certainly a better time trialist than uh, Pantani. Pantani has to knock at least a minute to a minute and a half uh, uh, out of Tonkov to make it run about two minutes. The, I'll have a little look for, for you just a moment in the results of the time trial in Trieste to see where the Tonkov finish in relationship to, to uh, uh, Pantani as we watch these two go away now. The one drifting off there, I think that might have been Konashev, of the Mercator Uno team that just drifted off the front. They've done a wonderful job today, Mercator Uno. And also as far as... Uh, uh Tonkov's concern, the work that's been done by his MAPE teammates, in particular Gianni Bugno, has been absolutely superb. And so now the showdown is here on Eurosport, and you can watch it with these two great stars battling away here. Tonkov, no uh, stranger to standing up at the end in Milan, at the end of the Tour of Italy with the pink jersey. He won the race in 1996. 
He was second in 1997. As far as Marco Pantone is concerned, his best place in the Tour of Italy was in 1994, when he finished second behind uh, Evgeny Berzin, who was also a very good time trial. That's one thing that, that uh, Pan, uh, Pantani hasn't got, it's the ability to, uh, to ride on the flat at great speed, and so he has to do it in the mountains, and there it was in 94 that Pantani finished second behind Evgeny Berzin, who was no great mountain climber, he got over them, as Tonkov does, very similar sort of riders, but uh, Berzin, a superb time trial, is one of the best, and that's how he distanced himself from Marco Pantani, uh, Miguel Indrain, who finished back in uh, third spot on that occasion. So now we're seeing perhaps a new uh, Pantani here in the pink. He may be possessed to try and go that much faster and take over. He's won the what they call the baby uh, Giro d'Italia. They have an amateur version. He's won that one. He's finishing the second or third it as well. And really, when he burst upon the scene, when he was. Uh, first uh, in the pro ranks and he's amazing in 1994 when he went on to finish in that uh, second spot he came from nowhere to finish second by the way right in the mountains like we've got here he was just taking minutes out of everybody and they said P -p 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 Pantani who's he and he went bang down the road he won two stages consecutively and went on to finish second overall now can he take the pink jersey into Milan he has to get rid of Tonkov he has to get rid of Tonkov and Tonkov will just sit there well, he writes for Mappy, he'll make glue, and I think he's glued to Pantani's back wheel, and Pantani will be wondering what he can do. This climb uh, all the way up to the top is not a nasty one. It's not like the Alpe d'Huez, for instance, when Pantani won uh, on the Tour de France the stage there last year, and, of course, he won the year before that as well. Pantani loves the really tough times climbs. This one has got a bit of a kick-up at the end. It's a 23.5% uh, at the back end. There's about a kilometre of really nasty climbing at the back end, but generally speaking, it sort of rolls up round about... Uh, 11%, 6%, 11%, 5%. I know these are odd languages to English cyclists because we talk about one in eights and one in fours and one in sixes and what have you, but um, they're fairly gentle until we get in the final, what, uh, three and a half kilometres or so, and then it does go up a bit. We've got a 21.7%, uh, just, what, two and a half, uh, three, yes, four, four kilometres from the finish. It goes up it, then it levels off, then that final last uh, kilometre is a really nasty one, and that is the only time I think that we're likely to see Pantani do any damage to Tonkov is when it gets very, very steep indeed. And he likes to accelerate quickly. Now, hanging on, very much uh, uh, just keeping hold of his uh, third place overall, Giuseppe Garini. Uh, he really wants to preserve his position now. He's 147 down on the general classification. That will put him up on the uh, rostrum in uh, Milan as a man who takes the third spot overall in the tour. He's looking good at the moment, but his other teammates have really taken an awful pasting. They've dropped way down out of sight because uh, uh, yesterday, uh, if you haven't caught up with the information, Luc Leblanc finished 15 minutes and 49 seconds down uh, on the winner, who was Pavel Tonkov, who came in just uh, ahead of Marco Pantani at one second. Michelli of Risa Scotti was third at 44 seconds, uh, Zula fourth, and Guarini, you see here, was fifth yesterday at one minute and seven seconds. Uh, Zula looked like he'd recovered yesterday. We've got 15 kilometres to go now. Zula yesterday came in 58 seconds down. He's had an awful day the day before, recovered yesterday, but uh, right now, if you come in and switch on your telly and you're picking up the Tour of Italy, whatever time of day it is, uh, let me explain that Zula uh, really had a very, very bad patch as about 80 kilometres from the finish. We went up the Coletto di Cadino. The last time check we had, uh, he'd lost uh, over eight minutes on these two. So he's going backwards, backwards, backwards. So his uh, hope of winning the Tour have now gone out of the window. But to going back to the problems yesterday on the climb when... Uh, uh, Rooks also dropped way back. He came in uh, 14 minutes, 59 seconds down, with, together with LeBlanc, and lost a lot of time. And Rooks, in fact, who had the pink jersey, just shows you the snakes and ladders of the big tours. If you're not used to what happens in the big tours, then over the three weeks, and they're racing for 22 days, day in, day out, some riders do well one day, suffer the next day, as we look down at Pantani and uh, Tonkov on your screen now. And what was I was chucked in? Oh, his glasses have gone. Oh, his sponsor won't like that. I mean, he'll have a spare pair by the time he gets to the finish. Um, 
As you can see the veins standing out on his head, can't you? The effort, he makes it look so calm. Once he's got his hat on and his glasses, you can't see the, the pressure he's putting himself on. And now look at Tonkov's face, um, how, how, how gaunt he is. Uh, early part of the season, uh, Tonkov had got quite a puffy face. He rode very well in the Tour of Romandy. We had that on Eurosport. And if you had got your tapes and you kept them, go back and look at the picture of Tonkov in the Tour of Romandy. And when he started, a bit puffy face and a bit podgy. But now the, the racing he's been doing is taking that extra weight off him. Pantani, by the way, has an extremely low uh, fat ratio. He said, come on, your turn. It's, I think it's 5%. He's, he's quite unique. He has very little fat on his body, uh, whereas some riders in the winter go a bit, um, bit pear-shaped. Now, we're looking at Tonkov here who's certainly very gaunt. He's certainly, over these last 2,000 miles, shed a bit of weight. Uh, they can do with the heat and the, the pressure under which they are. Tonkov uh, is the heavier of these two, not the gifted climber like uh, Pantani. I think Pantani's asking for help now. I think the two of them should ride together, but uh, Tonkov's doing the right thing. He's just letting Pantani set the pace, because the trouble with Pantani, if Tonkov went in front of Pantani in the pink jersey, then, then Pan, uh, Pantani, who's a very stop-go climber, could get behind Tonkov, Tonkov, and then when Tonkov starts to ride comfortably, Pantani could switch, accelerate, and Tonkov wouldn't very easily be able to respond. Guarini then back at 40 seconds at the moment. I'm talking about how many people have dropped out of the contention, then his teammate... Uh, hello? He's not asked what time of day... Oh, we let him... He said, come on the front now, now then. I'll try and watch the screen and tell you what the little thing... I was talking about Laurent Rooks, they had the pink jersey, stage 12. By... Uh, Stage 17, he was 14th at 13 minutes and 18 seconds. He dropped very quickly back in five stages. And then uh, stage 18 dropped to 25th at 28 minutes and 28 seconds. So it does show what the damage has been done since we've gotten these bandages. by well, the two chaps you're watching on your screen now. They make it look so easy, don't they? But it's hard. And there's blokes down the road. There's all the bike riders, I think, we're watching this programme. We've all been there racing long. I think, for goodness sake, why don't they ease back a bit? I'm suffering back here. And these two up the front having their own little private battle and shelling people out the back, left, right and centre. So that's it for the, some of the fellows who took an awful pacing yesterday. Like, so like Rooks, who's now uh, really down in 25th spot. Uh, he had the pink jersey and he's now right in 25th spot. So uh, the way that uh, Luc LeBlanc has dropped down. LeBlanc now is 43rd over on General Classic at 49 minutes and 31 seconds and he was up in the top 10 about uh, four days ago just shows the damage that has been caused by mr pantani the pirate and pavel tonkov the russian who is very much now i suppose as much italian as russian and uh, these two are about to give the rest of them a lesson in in uh, in riding big tours What a contrast. I suppose it's a bit like uh, the days, uh, they're different shape and different styles of riders, but the days when, uh, and they've come from different nations, one's Italian and one's Russian, but uh, in the old days when um, Fausto Coffey was riding with Bartoli, that Fausto Coffey was a, a very elegant, smooth climber, and he would very elegantly sit there, and whereas Bartoli was a much more lungeful rider, who would ride the bigger gears, and whereas, whereas Coffey would ride all up the mountain at um, a very good pace and shell everybody out the back wheel, uh, the Bartoli was able in the last sort of three kilometres to really put the pressure on and push a much bigger gear and, uh, and really thrash people that way. So I think Tonkov is quite capable of pushing a much bigger gear. Now you watch the feet go round, and you I'm sure that if you watch the revs of the feet, that, that Pantani is pushing much lower gears than uh, than, than, than Tonkov. Will rely probably on brute, brute strength as he did do yesterday to zoom past uh, Pantani to get the stage victory. Sitting low, nice and comfortable. Pantani has to drop Tonkov. He has to take a good minute out of him. I suppose the only thing that Tonkov can, that Pantani can hope for is that Tonkov goes through a bad patch. Uh, Guarini's still playing as well up here. In fact, his other two teammates, as I say, Luc Leblanc and uh, Rebelin, who are the most uh, uh, tip riders for a place in the top ten, are now really out of the frame. So a lot of interest of the Palti team that uh, Guarini, who uh, will be moving up on general classification as a result of this one, also making sure he's well away of Zula, because Zula's right down the pan. And I would suspect uh, uh, this morning, as uh, Zula was only two minutes and eight seconds, 
Lucas down on, on Pantani at about three and a bit minutes ahead of Kamazin. Kamazin's also been playing havoc with uh, Zula further back, so Zula could be dropping down probably around about seventh overall, and the rest will be moving up away. So this uh, Giuseppe Guarini could be looking at a much, much better uh, third spot. He lost a minute uh, yesterday on uh, Tonkov and Pantani. He's going to lose some time today, but I think his third place can be well assured uh, as we go into the time trial on Saturday. Tomorrow we're going to have an undulating course. It's, there's nothing spectacular, really. There's a bit of a climb to begin with, and I suspect tomorrow uh, when we... Uh, come out on Eurosport with the uh, with the programme. We might see Mr Claudio Chiapucci or even perhaps Bugno going for a stage victory. I think tomorrow is the day, as we saw Axelson today, trying to get a stage victory when the uh, the, the, the top boys will be posed, uh, uh, poised watching each other. There isn't enough for them to split the, uh, the the field tomorrow and I think they'll wait until the time trial on Saturday so we can have another interesting change in uh, the procedures tomorrow when somebody who hasn't won much or got much in the bank from their uh, work so far will start to come good. So that'll make a different sort of race tomorrow. One thing I love about the big tours is that you get each day there's a different uh, set of players, although they all start out all together, all with the same hopes and ambitions, Pantani, his whole thoughts were on the particular stages that finished at uh, up altitude or were, had lots of uh, climbs in towards the end. And Tonkov knew exactly the same thing too, but also knowing he was good time trialist, was there to try and make sure he didn't lose too much time to be like Zilla on the stage in Trest, but they shot Paul Zilla out now, and I'm interested to find out at the end of the stage exactly what hit him, because he went backwards, just like somebody had hammered him on the head with a nail and sort of fastened him to the, the tarmac, he just went, Psh, that was it, and his teammates have dropped back to help him, but there's no way they can tie him up, so the battle we're going to watch on Eurosport is this between Tonkov and Pantani for first and second place, and uh, not only now, but with the, setting the stage for the, the time trial on Saturday. Averaging, you see, 21 kilometres per hour, on this climb up here and it's oh, it doesn't like that at all see some of these the enthusiastic uh, spectators think they're helping some of these riders but in reality they are disturbing the concentration you can't miss your rhythm you must concentrate you sit there and just think where they've been actually now they've covered something like 140 miles we started at 9 30 in the morning going to finish at around about 5 30 in the afternoon something like uh, eight hours of racing and somebody comes up splashing with the water you don't really want sometimes you do sometimes you don't but uh, in reality it's a tough old way to uh, to go about your day's work. It'll be a long, hard day. There's still a lot to come yet toward the top of this one. And goodness, I haven't a clue of these two who's going to get the stage victory. No, it isn't turning out to be raining. That was just a splash of water from one of the spectators on the side of the road. And what has been a jolly nice day as far as the weather is concerned, as far as the riders are concerned, a long, hard day in the office because uh, they've been uh, at it now since 9.30 this morning, and so they're going to be presumably something like the thick end of eight hours on their bicycles. The first three or four hours, nothing much happened, but uh, since we got about 80 kilometres out from the finish, there has been an absolute purge going on, with Alex Zilla being the worst man that suffered the worst all. Garini here this morning starting out on the general classification in third spot has been now distanced by Pantani and Tonkov, Zola even further back so I think the scene is now set for a great showdown towards the back end of the race between these two riders on this final climb of the day up to the top of the Plan de Monte Campignoni uh, we're in the sort of the mountains just a bit north of the big plain of Lombardy and a lot of people have come out to watch the drama unfold before their very eyes. Uh, some of the riders picked further down the slope. You can see here struggling to stay in contention, stay with the race at the moment. Uh, all of them desperately trying to keep their position because a lot of money at stake in this race and prestige as well. And, of course, points in the UCI classifications, which means that uh, in the end you will get yourself uh, a good contract the following year if you've got plenty of points to, to show to your prospective em employers. Uh, there's Sicari from the Screenio Gan team, and this one you're looking at now on your screen, Daniel Clavero. We're now back up to our two leaders at the front. Uh, Clavero this morning started at seven spot for Vitalicio Seguros, 11 minutes and 59 seconds. And the rider he was with from the, uh, the uh, Screeno team was much further back, so he's obviously now improving his position overall. We're watching these two. I'm just checking the position overall. Sicari was 33rd this morning at 35 minutes and 52 seconds, so Sicari uh, from the Screeno Gan team will do well today the way he's gone so far in this race. It looks good kill. 
<laughs> I think Mr. Pantana is not too happy at the moment. He fell into the trap a couple of years ago, calling him, calling him the singing Kojak. And was Kojak watching, not realising that Mr. Kojak was dead? And uh, but he is he's quite a, a, a lad with the guitar. Oh no, watch out! I've just seen the sign on the on the road of the devil himself. The uh, Neptune's trident is there, which says any minute now we're going to be attacked by a gentleman wearing a red cape and a funny hat with a strange bike on the side of the road. I don't believe it. It's just to prove they're not not all locked up yet. He'll definitely appear any minute now. Wait, wait, wait. If you haven't seen him before on TV, perhaps the, the cameras are going to go the other way. He's got his own symbol out there. He travels ahead of the race every day. They set himself up in the last uh, uh, 10 kilometres or so and uh, comes around the, the, the big tours, and particularly the, the Tour de France, and leaps about and uh, enjoys himself. But it was a hell of a job to tow the, the big bike he has on the back of his, his car and set up camp somewhere. But there were even more tridents there. Then go and paint your tridents on the side of the road. It doesn't actually make... Here it is, I told you. <laughs> One day, he's going to have a heart attack. It must be, what, eight or nine years since I first saw this character. And he's both bumped into somebody. Don't stab him with your trident. <laughs> he's got that vicious vi uh, uh, weapon in his hand. He's running up there and he bumps into somebody. There'll be, there'll be somebody out there skewered if they're not careful. Oh, dear. Well, bike racing is all about fun and frivolity. And the people on the side are appreciating the performance here. The people go by. Uh, one thing I like about cycling, it's not full of yubbos who you know, drink lager and throw things at people, though it has been known uh, during this race so far an egg hit to Gianni Bugno at one point because somebody flung an egg at him and it hit him straight in the face and then on, not to do with spectators um, he was riding about a couple of days later and a wasp went uh, up inside uh, his shorts and stung him in a very important place where he keeps the family jewels and the poor fellow and he had to spend the whole of the day pedaling his bike out the saddle but normally speaking all you get is enthusiastic people who just want to uh, uh, run alongside or stand on the side of the road and encourage these great people these great riders they they've read about so the the exploits in the past they want to see them in the flesh they sweat and puff and pant and go by them and they come out here and spend hours on the side of the road having barbecues and parties and knocking back the odd drop of vino and then uh, when the race comes through here they come and then after it's all over and done with i've said it before but i have to repeat these things sometimes because we get new viewers for cycling on eurosport this lot has to go down the mountainside and all of uh, the you know us commentators officials have to come down as well the enormous traffic jams build up they try and get off the mountain cycle there's not always a route over the top sometimes you finish up at a ski resort and that's it and you've got to get down the next day and boy we had a few problems getting down off the top of some of these mountains but the riders get prefer pre preferential treatment they're bunged into team cars and are taken off if they've got to go down the mountain and outrider motorcyclists the police take them down the mountainside pushing out all the private traffic the the private traffic goes on the right hand side of the road the race traffic goes on the left hand side of the road and everybody gets off the mountain as quick as they can do at the end of the race but that doesn't happen very quickly because the some rides today are going to be up to 20 minutes down maybe 25 minutes down on these two rides when they finish so they can't actually go back down the mountain if the hotels are down the mountain on this occasion but uh, or wherever they are if they have to go down the mountain, they can't do it till everybody else has come up the mountain and they've, they've cleared the whole of the race route out the way. And then the spectators start on the way down. Ten kilometres to go. Yes, Vai Bunyo, and I agree entirely, he's done a sterling performance today as Bunyo, as these two, Pantani in the pink. And uh, no, that's it. See, oh, spot on. Well done. Ten out of ten. Why do you say that? Because it's 10 kilometres ago? No, you're not allowed to feed, uh, give your rise drinks in the last 10 kilometres, and the, the MAP-18 car came up, and within two or three metres of the 10-kilometre board, they handed him a drink. Absolute perfect timing. In fact, I think he put most of it in his head, but that was the final bit of encouragement from the team car, and uh, he shouldn't really take those drinks because he could be fined by the people behind, they're coming up now, I think there's just spectators pouring water onto the uh, riders, but uh, after 10 kilometres to go, in fact the Mappe man, I'm um, chapping the Mappe shirt there, was trying to, they're offering things, no, 10 kilometres to go, it's up the riders, they have to ride these 10 k's now, and the official help is not allowed to come up alongside them to give them drinks. That's six miles. In certain circumstances, the officials might relax the rule if it's baking hot and they feel the riders are going to dehydrate. There are certain times they're prepared to relax the rules, but there are rules about this because uh, 
they need to allow the riders to settle in and race their way up here. Look at this big turnout of uh, clubmen here. Many of these uh, people will be going off, by the way, on Sunday. There's a big ride down over the stage on the Sunday into Milan, which is open to all sorts of people. There's thousands of them enter and ride down there. They all get a, a pink uh, T-shirt to ride in, and off they go, and they ride the route of the uh, uh, people who've ridden the big tour all the way down uh, into Milan to the finish. 1.28, the gap back then to... Uh, uh, the, the two chases at the moment are just settling in here. Now, what's happened to Guarini, I asked myself? They didn't pick Guarini up because he before was between these two and the two at the front. So, Havel Tonkov still tracking down uh, behind Pantani. Last year, won the stage with overall victory in the Tour of Romandy. Won three stages in the Tour of Italy, finished second overall in the Tour of Italy last year. Won a stage two in the uh, Tour of Spain. Pavel Tonkov sitting behind uh, uh, Pantani now. In 1996, he won the Tour of Italy, having won a stage as well. Won three stages in the uh, uh, Settimana Bergamasca. And now we're back then with the bus, as it's called. It's still Tonkov sitting here uh, waiting for the action to take. He specialises in the big tours. He, he won a stage in 1993 in the Tour of Switzerland. He went on then to take a stage and the final in the overall classification of the 1995 Tour of Switzerland as well. And now he's alongside uh, Pantani, the specialist climber, who's hoping now that he can uh, perhaps come past uh, the man in front because the Russian Pavel Tonkov is sitting there looking good at the moment then. Marco Pantani, who fought after uh, over a year out of cycle racing with that terrible injury when he, he broke uh, his legs when he came thundering down the mountain in the race Milan Turin and splash, bang, crash into a, a four-wheel uh, drive vehicle that was coming up the other way, being loud on the course, nobody knew about him, bang, he hit it, smashed his bike, smashed his legs, had to spend a long time recovering Pantani and he's done it and now he's still here we are now back with Guarini in third spot still now trying to get that pink jersey all the way into Milan what a tremendous day's bike racing we had it started fairly flat and uninteresting when we came out this morning for the first three hours but it really has erupted since then the battle goes on for the pink jersey a quick thing by the way about pink jerseys we have a strange man, uh, Mr. Uh, Wayne Pink uh, Baker, who rides on a tricycle and rides with the Stavish Cycling Club, and he's actually going with a hat, hat, about 30 tricycle riders to take part in a, a big race in France on the 20th and 21st of June, an international tricycle challenge race, and he's going to be dressed in pink. I don't think he's got anything to do with Pantani. He must just like the colour. Will the pink jersey be with Pantani at the end of the stage today, then? Because he started out this morning with 27 seconds advantage over over, over um Tomkov. There are 12 seconds bonus at the end of the stage for first man. Eight seconds for second. So these two are vying at the moment. There's four seconds will split when they get to the end of it all. Uh, so Pantani can't really take the top here. He has to attack Tonkov. He has to open up the gap because coming into the time trial on Saturday, he needs more than 27 seconds or thereabouts to hope to take the pink jersey. And he's got to come up on the inside. He's going to attack him. No, he rolls on, seven kilometres to go. This is a magnificent battle fought out. Right up now, they're over 1,125 metres above sea level. They're heading up to 1,750 metres above sea level. At the bottom of the climb, they're 205 metres above sea level. The total climb they'll be on now will be 1,500 metres of climbing, and they've still got some way to go. They've been in the saddle, you can see there, on the clock. The Festina clock, they've lost Mrs. Ulli, he's lost the race now, but they've arrived the time, which shows they spent nearly seven and a half hours in the saddle. They've got about seven kilometres to go toward the top. The battle's not over yet, as Tonkov here, looking very determined indeed, as probably the world's best specialist climber glued to his back wheel. But Pantani must be wondering, can he then attack? You now, in the uh, final, what, two and a half, three and a half kilometres, there's a nasty bit of a, a, a lunge. They're on this sort of more gentle part right now. It's not too difficult here from the run-up to, from Monte Campione up towards the top of the Plan de Monte Campione. This is the, the gentle part, and just after this one, it really kicks up. There's a 21.7% climb, and that is a one-kilometre climb. Pantani has to attack at that particular point. Thank <laughs> you.